Thank you for in inviting me. Welcome to Cyber Day 2020. 2020, which is already said quite a special year, and um, we have to do this in in using technology, uh, doing conferences using technology with um, all the capacity that capacity that we have built in the last years. Uh, it's it, it's nice to see that as a society we managed to use technology in the in the way that we can still continue conferences and such things. So let's talk a bit about technology, about new technology. Um, I would like to talk a bit as an introduction about IoT, Internet of Things. You probably heard about that one, um, which is considered to be new technology. Um, but as you will probably know or, or see soon, at least, what I wanted to show you is that it's basically old risks old security aspects that um, we have to, to deal with in a new in a new shape. Okay. So what is IoT in that of things? Well it's taking these sensors, microcontrollers and all other fancy electronics and put them into these, into normal objects. Um, like umbrellas, like uh, lamps, like all these kind of normal objects that, that you know, and with the objective to connect them together so that they can interact these objects without human intervention to make them so-called smart. Um, well, are they really so smart? Is it really smart to have an umbrella that is has a sensor and is capable of telling you that it's raining. Well, it might be useful for people that are that are um, <laughs> blind, or I don't know. But uh, um, sometimes you see a lot of very special or very weird things in in IoT. So let's look at more the security uh, aspect of it. starting with the smart wearables or I would say all the these fancy electronics that you can put on your body or even in your body, um, like watches, like uh, uh, shoes that have that have that have uh, electronic sensors and and calculating your your running speed, that kind of things, or T-shirts with electronics, and all these are controlled. So your, your control station, that's that's the mobile phone. And even the mobile phone itself has close to 13 different sensors in it. So it can tell you um, uh, where you are. It has a GPS. It can tell you how fast you move. It has an accelerator. It can tell you in which um, uh, you shake the mobile phone, etc. cetera, gyroscope can even tell you uh, the temperature, et cetera, et cetera. So very, uh, a lot of sensors are in this small little device, already in there, trying to make your life easier. Same as the, the and, uh, let's see. Uh, and it's, uh, So with all these devices, the body is being interconnected, so to say. So your 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 feet can talk to your to your um, uh, to your heart, for instance, for for, for cal calculating the heart rate, etc. Um, and all this, I would say, can be kind of can be kind of useful or, or helpful. Um, at home, you probably know or have heard about this Google Assistant or Alexa, these kind of microphones that you put in your living room and that listen to everything that happens in your living room uh, and that you can activate by your voice to, I would say, to uh, uh, to avoid touching uh, things. 
could be an interesting uh, COVID-19, uh, I would say, uh, suggestion. Um, but obviously, these um, Google Assistant or other, other devices are listening all the time, not only when you um, <coughs> call them or when you activate them, unfortunately. And all this data needs to be processed somewhere, which is not in the device itself. It will happen in the cloud somewhere by a certain company. And so all your data is floating away outside of your, of your home, which is security wise not very not very uh, not very useful but we tend to do this voluntary and these things into our into our living rooms uh, without thinking about the the next steps another more i would say more uh, even more intrusive example is about smart toys <clears throat> maybe you have heard about the kyla at home a dog called Kyla, uh, which came to the market uh, some years ago, and uh, which was capable of listening and talking to your children, uh, to your future children, <laughs> looking at the audience. Um, and so, so this doll could, could tell stories to your, to your children, interact and, and talk with, with the children. Um, kind of fancy, but again, it's technology and Technology, as we all know here, has vulnerabilities, has issues if you if you don't implement it correctly. And this color doll is a specific example, a very good example of, of such bad impl implementation of technology um, because it had some huge vulnerabilities, some very easy to exploit vulnerabilities as well. Um, and one security researcher was even uh, uh, capable of using, of, con of hacking the doll fro from the internet, obviously, um, via its connection with the um, structure that it is using from, from, uh, from, the, from the vendor, and was able to inject voice messages into, into, into the doll, and with that uh, was capable of opening doors even because the little thing we saw besides the um, the Google Assistant is a smart lock, which is a thing that can open doors by your, with your voice. And by hacking the door, the guy could open the doors via the internet. So this is quite interconnected. All of this, yeah. Well, uh, it's the internet or thing, but we tend to only see the things, not the internet. And that's where a lot of, a lot of problems uh, come in. An interesting story with this doll is that um, this raised a lot of awareness and um, uh, some authorities specifically uh, uh, banned doll from, from the market and, and started to think about specific IoT security measures like FBI and also in some EU countries. And nowadays we have also we have Enisa publishing a lot of IoT cybersecurity uh, recommendations. If you happen to be in Berlin at a certain point of time when traveling is again uh, allowed, there is an, a, muse a museum of spying, and they have also this doll as one of the spying, one of the modern spying devices. Um, as you know, all other all other I would say devices or equipment in your home can be interconnected like fridges, washing machines, etc. So from a connected body, we come to a connected house. Um, inside and outside, so surveillance uh, cameras uh, uh, are also part of this Internet of Things, of this connected uh, house. And with the, the IP cameras, there's another interesting uh, story around it is that um, some years ago, um, people or some criminals detected vulnerability in such IP cameras, and they used them not to to spy on on the people that use these cameras, but they abused them as zombie computers to create a kind of army for an attack 
a DDoS style attack on an, 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 uh, specific, a specific target. That was the Mirror case, you probably heard about that one, which also raised some, some quite interesting uh, awareness. Um, but obviously, these devices have um, camera, obviously, and, and often also uh, microphones, uh, can also obviously be used to spy, to, um, to um, yeah, spy on, on, on people. Um, <clears throat> and there maybe uh, you, you have seen this uh, in 2018 when there was this summit between Trump and, and Putin. Uh, the research or the, the, the um, uh, detection, the attacks against devices that have microphones and cameras raised by uh, uh, enormously during that during that summit, probably both nations were trying to get access to devices that were kind of used in in the different delegations to to get some prior knowledge about the discussion. Um, another, another interesting aspect of of, of smart home uh, is smart metering. That's the Meters is, is the gas, water, electricity counters that, that are in your house and that, that uh, check how much you use. These also get smart, so they, they, get, they are connected nowadays to in, the internet and they tell your provider um, regularly how much electricity you, you use, etc. Which is, I would say, again, can be useful, but if it is exploited, well, Criminals could identify when somebody is at home and when not, and then use it as an as an uh, as an intrusion um, argument. So, so from smart homes, we also move, we move to smart offices, complete office buildings using uh, connectivity being interconnected, and um, uh, there again it is uh, useful to protect these systems. Uh, also, some a few years ago, here in Luxembourg, uh, we were notified about an air conditioning control system that was open on the internet of a building here in Luxembourg, uh, and could be, I would say, uh, adjusted uh, and making the people inside uncomfortable. Smart cars, obviously, you have heard about these ones. Um, the GPEG hack, uh, probably, where people Connect, were able to, con to connect via the internet through the wireless hotspots in the car and um, found a, a vulnerability to move from the multimedia part electronics of the car to the vehicle electronics of the car and then from the internet steer the car. So they could brake, they could accelerate, they could, um, the only thing that they could not uh, steer. But that's kind of that's kind of that's kind of scary. And not only I would say that's not only e cars or that's not only the very modern cars, but all cars uh, today. There is even an an uh, an European directive that um, obliges new cars to have this emergency button. Maybe you heard about that one, which is a which is an, uh, an uh, a button that you can uh, when there is an accident or when, when there is, I would say, uh, an, an, a big issue and which is also activated automatically, for instance, if the airbag uh, uh, opens. And this enables the car manufacturer to control your car from the distance. So it can break, it can, it can even move it a little bit around. So, wait, that, that's, that's a security feature. It's for, it's in, for an emergency case, but it shows that, I would say, there is a link somewhere, and if this link can be uh, compromised, well, then you have you can have a big issue. So it's 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 a bit where a bit in 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 the in this area where we want have some good ideas, want to put things, but I would say don't think the uh, don't reflect until the end. Like in medical, um, in healthcare, in medical, this is what you see on the picture is a pacemaker. Um, pacemaker with a wife, which includes a Wi-Fi connection. 
Uh, so the, the pacemaker, which is in your body, which I would say makes sure that your heart your heart doesn't stop working, connects to your Wi-Fi in your home, and via your DSL connection um, sends your heart rate and and some other uh, data to your doctor to your doctor who then who can then by by an uh, by a back. Uh, interact with the pacemaker from a distance and enhance or, or, or change change parameters. Um, again, that can be quite useful because you avoid going to the doctors all the time. But obviously, people could uh, interact. And there is a very famous um, example of this: uh, a Norwegian researcher, Nuri Mo who uh, presented her research in Luxembourg some years ago about her own pacemaker. Uh, she she um, unfortunately has a heart problem and, and got this pacemaker. And she identified no less than five very critical vulnerabilities in, in the pacemaker, which included uh, clear text transmission of information, uh, which included uh, Passwords that could be, I would say, recovered from from the device that was stored somewhere, uh, which included um, data not being encrypted at all, etc. Et so I would say the basics. But we still find all these basic security issues today. We don't find them in computers anymore, but in pacemakers, which is kind of scary. <clears throat> and the, the evolution, yeah, uh, revolution continues. Smart factories and uh, smart cities. So interconnecting all these things. So your body, your your t-shirt, your, your 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 watch con is connected with the um, uh, with the 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 different devices uh, in in your home, and your home is connected to other homes, to the factory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all this is is um, not happening one after the other. But in parallel, all this is happening now, today, at the moment, in parallel. And a lot of security issues are being identified. And a lot of work is waiting for all of us. So what are the, uh, a few lessons learned, or the, I would say the, the, the quintessence, the conclusion of all this? Well, as I already told, uh, Enisa is work, has done a lot of work, is, is doing a lot of interesting recommendations, but it's still recommendations. So. I think there still needs to be a step of, of regulation, so to, to oblige certain um, security features like it is in other areas like fire or, or these kind of these kind of uh, areas, which is I would say really impacting the complete society. So life cycle, uh, the security of the of the life cycle of, of products, and uh, also the supply chain security. That's that's the two. I would say big topics uh, at the moment. The risks are, as I said in the very beginning, are quite old. It's more or less the same what we see with with other devices or what we see, what we saw with computers 20 years ago, which is um, account or hide or data hijack. Well, we see this still a lot today, um, but here it is not the account of your Twitter account or of your another Amazon account. Here it is. The, the uh, account of your air conditioning or of your fridge, for instance. Um, and maybe the data which is in there is maybe uh, more sensitive to you, at least, than uh, than the one that is on, on, on Amazon. Uh, then the example of rogue or zombie devices being used for, for other types of, of, of attacks. And obviously, I didn't talk about the mass surveillance capacity that uh, Google Assist or all these devices, um, or even this year, with uh, Siri or all these features activated, and listen, I would say, at any moment to what you think. So that's quite uh, that's quite uh, uh, disturbing. Obviously, in having huge impact on on, on privacy. What are now the recommendations? So for every individual. Uh, recommendations are, I would say, quite quite uh, classical. Uh, using a strong password policy, I would say, or at least the well, change to default passwords, 
when you when you buy the device. Because in general, it is admin or one to five or that kind of password or even no password at all. Um, I think you know what the strong password means. Today, that means at least 16 characters. That means letters. That means uh, numbers. That means other characters, other 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 special characters. Um, and you should not think password anymore. You should think passphrase. Use sentences. So you are way above the 16, and you are you are uh, uh, really um, more secure. Updates of obviously software and specifically firmware updates of of IoT devices is is a big issue. Um, but if security has not been put into the life cycle or into the design process or during the supply chain, well, then it needs to be done afterwards. And uh, uh, updating is is really key. As uh, as these two things are today not given at all, the recommendation is really to isolate your IoT devices in separate uh, parts of the network, so that if they get hacked, they at least cannot. Um, put, create more damage in, in your environment. Also, physical security is important because uh, these devices can be accessis accessible by the outside. Uh, for instance, uh, video cameras that are um, on the building. Uh, well, it is a good recommendation to put the internet cable to connect it inside the building, not outside, because then you have an an, an inter, internet interface outside of your building, and someone could put out the camera and put his laptop in there, and he's in your he's in your building. That's things, unfortunately, that has been have been seen. So um, about all the privacy issues, obviously, in contracts, in the terms and conditions, uh, the the little text, light gray on white, that's the one that you have to read because that's where these kind of of uh, issues are, are, are hidden. And as Brian Krebs would say, if you don't need it, don't use it. Uh, I'm talking about IoT because very soon, in fact, uh, uh, this week, uh, here in Luxembourg, we will launch an, a new campaign, an, a national campaign about IoT security. You find the internet site already up, up there, secure-iot.lu. It is not online yet, uh, uh, unfortunately, but will uh, will be soon, and uh, a lot of information about I would be shared. And um, all of you that are interested in this obviously can participate in this. And don't hesitate if you identify interesting articles or interesting cases uh, that we could integrate it into the into the campaign. Thank you very much. During this time, I'm taking the opportunity to thank all the speakers that have made their way to Valval here to stand in front of the uh, BTS class from Vissi Guillaume Kroll, who were volunteers to come and to join us here in this large uh, yeah, meeting room uh, where we only had the permission to have a few people inside. But thank you very much to the students of the BTS class for having come and joined this meeting here. So thank you. And also to the speakers already now, a big thank you for being here, such that the room is not so empty. And now I would like to announce you the next speaker, who is Jalil Bourbois, and he's from Post Luxembourg, and he will tell you a bit about uh, phones and how they can freak you out. Thank you. What? So today we are going to talk about freaking with this presentation, keep your phone safe or they can freak you out. And basically uh, you probably notice that actually I put a PH instead of an F in the word freaking, maybe because uh, it's just a word play to say that actually today we're going to talk about freaking. So, freaking, actually, you can see, uh, I just put actually the picture of two devices. So, these two devices has not so much keys, not so much, I don't know if there is any memory inside, 
and of course, actually not so much computer power. But in case you know how to use this device, this kind of device, and particularly for hackers manipulating this device, it can be very, very harmful. And you see that actually you don't need, in order to do freaking, uh, a lot of technology. But at the end, what is freaking? Freaking actually is a type of hacking that concerns telecommunication environment. And actually you can see two pictures. One picture is a whistle, a red whistle, coming actually from the serial Captain Crunch in the United States. And that was used actually in the late 70s, uh, early 80s, uh, to actually break the billing of uh, communication. It means that at that time, if actually you use this whistle, it actually reproduce a sound of 2600 hertz. And actually the signal, uh, when actually it's, uh, you blow the, uh, this whistle, can actually stop the billing and then all the calls became free. And actually that was one of the first type of freaking that was existing. And the other type, actually the other pictures see, as you can see, is actually what we call a blue box. And the blue box actually was used in the 70s and early 80s, mainly actually to allow anyone to make free calls. And just for your culture, before actually Apple computer, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak was actually selling these blue boxes. So that was their first business before actually building Apple computer. So then you can see that there is really a business behind actually making and even actually, if this appears also not so much technology uh, wise, it's actually still having some interest for bad actors. But at the end, uh, nowadays, as actually there is a lot of bundle in terms of subscription, uh, so everything is unlimited communications, everything through data. There is actually still some interest today in freaking from bad actors. But what is the main interest? bad actors. Obviously, actually, you can see that there is uh, first someone that's uh, a victim, which has been freed out, uh, that received a bill, uh, and actually in his bill, he received what we call a bill shock, meaning actually that he see a lot of fees uh, in his bill, that a lot of communication that he didn't uh, made, and actually was obliged to pay for this communication. So at the end, actually, this money he go actually delivers to the operator. This all question of billing monetization that goes to the pocket of the potential attacker that pass to freak uh, just uh, actually the, the the victim. But again, how is it possible? It's actually by using two things. The first thing is what we call an IPRN, which is called also international premium uh, rate number. And actually, with the, with, by having actually this number, by buying actually this number from a premium number host, uh, which actually give you the right to exploit actually this uh, uh, number. So every time someone call this number, special rate is applied, and all the money will go in your in actually the, the pocket of a, an attacker, a potential attacker. And uh, actually, this is called an international ISRSF. Uh, international revenue share fraud. And it consists to, as I said, actually being a victim, which has been freaked out, and actually getting out of money, paying the bill, and then getting out of money from the bill from an operator A. And actually, all the operators over the world, when you do a communication, there is actually what we call some interoperator exchange, where actually uh, revenue are shared between the operator. It's partially, for, uh, it's partially true for premium number. And actually, this money goes to an operator premium number host, uh, which actually refund the IP or an owner, which is at the end a potential attacker. This is actually the main interest in freaking nowadays, because of course now uh, there is actually still a business, it's still active, but there is also other interests in for bad actors. And the most known, and we will talk about one case, specific case that happened actually very recently, is actually breaching authentication through SMS. Because nowadays, actually mobile communications, and of course actually the usage of SMS has been very popular 
by using a, uh, used as multi-factor authentication or password recovery. This is also used by actually breaching privacy. And breaching privacy, of course, because everything uh, goes mobile. So actually we have almost all our life actually concentrated in one single device that we have everywhere. And this is actually probably one of the first time uh, nowadays that we have actually so much uh, data, so much personal information, identifiable information inside one single device. And actually the last but not least case is of course identity theft. And I will show you how actually that can be possible. So now, how this can happen, actually, I just want to show you some cases inspired by real life incident. And probably you were already victim if you have a mobile a victim of what we call actually pin call or one geary. A pin call actually is uh, uh, someone, or a call that you just receive and you just don't have the time to, uh, to, uh, to, to take the call. And actually, by, by actually receiving the, this call, some people has the, the, the actually the, some manners to call back automatically the number which is actually shown in uh, the mobile. And this is quasi systematic. But the thing is that in case you are doing this with a premium number, an IPRN, you can actually expose yourself to a specific uh, actually fraud with actually all the consequences that I already showed you. So what's going on? So let's say that we have actually an attacker that make a call with uh, this actually um, IPRN to different victims. Let's say in Luxembourg, uh, I can put, take a random a list of random numbers and then actually we call them the victim. You will have, of course, one ring call made to all these actually devices and that stops. And later after, you have two victims that call back the 600 ABC and the 600 XYZ. Then by doing actually this call, they are also victim, of course, of being identified by the attacker as actually a customer. So it means that in case they uh, try to uh, call again, back again and again and again, because this is just one case, but this can happen several times. And in case actually there is some customer or your number is identified as uh, calling back, you have actually a, a lot of chance to be called back again and again. And the effect behind actually pin call is very actually dangerous for the one that receiving calls uh, uh, without actually, a uh, that intempestive actually receiving calls like that, we have actually this happened. So at the end of the month or at the end of the billing cycle, there is of course actually a bill shock. So the victim of the, this number XYZ has been freaked out. The money is getting out of his bill and actually getting back to the pocket attacker of the, the pocket of the attacker. But fortunately, actually operator are providing actually some response against one gear. So the first actually type of response is of course to get some information actually from the signalization of communication, not necessarily the communication itself, but actually what's going on to establish a call. Some data are collected through uh, uh, actually an, an analytic platform. And through this analytic platform, there is actually some alerts which are introduced and some detection which is made. In case there is a bad actor that wants to actually perpetrate a Wangiri, this is detected by the analytic platform and then blocking the number. And that actually kind of uh, analytics makes impossible the way to uh, reach actually the objective of the attacker, which is the victim to uh, actually uh, perpetrate a one giri uh, attack. There is of course actually one giri, but there is also uh, that concern more company, but other case that concerns uh, what we call private brands exchange, PBX. So you probably saw in some company uh, that there is actually, in case there is a phone number and there is a new employee, uh, they need actually a phone number. And all actually this configuration is made by the company and the company attribute one specific phone number to one user. 
But sometimes it happens that uh, actually this uh, administrative, uh, the administrative actually uh, uh, interface of the PBX is available on the internet. So in case an attacker uh, attempt to uh, grant, uh, attempt to get an access from this PBX uh, platform, he can actually, uh, in case the, the, the access is granted, he can actually generate the same uh, attack, but at the end, he take the control of the communication and then perpetrating uh, the, the, the fraud. And the schema is always the same. So it means that we have the victim, which is the boss of the company receiving the bill, which is more substantial as, uh, than what we saw actually in the one Geary case, as actually the, the bill can uh, can be actually very uh, very high for a company, and actually it, this can be very harmful for a business itself. But this is just actually one case that happened uh, that has been inspired by reality. Unfortunately, there is also actually in the same way as one Geary, some way actually to uh, protect uh, some customers against. Uh, this kind of uh, fraud. In case actually there is an access granted and some attempt to call uh, a premium uh, number with actually having a very aggressive way to do so, then actually data is collected from the, net uh, from the network and then actually some analytics is made, the call is detected and the number is blocked as actually we do in one Gary. This is actually a very basic um, uh, use case, but by doing this, uh, this can protect a lot companies against this kind of fraud and actually containing uh, the phenomenon of PBX fraud. The last but not least case actually is probably you, you saw it actually in the news. It's a very actual problem. It's actually SIM swapping. I know that we are going to get out of the traditional actually uh, phone activity to go actually on this activity. SIM swap actually means the fact to change actually the SIM card uh, on the behalf of some victim. And actually by doing so, uh, the processing from an attacker starts always the same. So this is a collection of personal identifiable information. And in case actually some PII are found somewhere on the internet, on social networks, on somewhere actually uh, where data are stored out of a data leakage or somewhere else, you get actually the in this example the phone actually the information the PII of Mr. A B living in C with the phone number three five two six hundred something. But you can guess easily by having actually this information and partially in Luxembourg that this uh, six hundred is a hint for uh, actually an operator. So for six two one is post Luxembourg. So for six nine one is uh, uh, Tango. For six six one is uh, Orange. So actually you can guess easily the operator, except if the customer here has a, um, ported the phone number in another actually uh, operator, but this is a hint. And what happens later after? There is actually some social engineering by an attacker to convince and uh, impersonating the victim to convince actually the operator that he is actually the, the owner of this SIM card. And then he will ask actually the operator to change this by having already a SIM card, a virgin SIM card from, an, uh, from the operator and convince the, him, or convince the operator, sorry, to change the SIM card. Now what? What's happening? The SIM is swapped, so several cases. The first case, of course, actually is putting the SIM cards among other victims in a device called a SIM box. And by this, doing actually this SIM box, connecting this to a mobile network called C, and then generating actually call IRSF, as uh, actually shown already, and then freaking a new, uh, new potential victims as the same one to get back the money. But there is actually also another case uh, related to identity theft. I just want to show you actually something right here, which is basically the instruction in Twitter, in case actually you are losing your the, the password, you can check actually on Twitter the the instruction and the procedure. In case actually you have registered your uh, uh, phone number uh, and actually getting the password recovery as SMS, 
you can actually follow this instruction and then uh, actually recover your password by SMS. But what happens if, in case a bad actor have your line, meaning your phone number and your SIM card uh, uh, actually coupled in a phone in a network and impersonating your identity? You just have to follow the instruction, and by following the instruction, so you connect to Twitter. You just actually receive an SMS with a code. You put the code in Twitter, and then you change the password. Sorry. And then he has actually the account granted, access granted for Mr. AB. Very easy. And uh, just to give you an example, there is a very known um, victim, and that was, I think, one month ago. The Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter himself, that has been victim of a SIM swap and where actually his account was hijacked. So this is basically what is possible by actually doing SIM swapping. So you can do fraud, you can do identity death, and actually very a lot of actually things. So to conclude actually this presentation, actually freaking represents almost over the world per year 12 billion in terms of costs. So it means that in actually your bill, uh, this is actually what represents freaking every year. So even actually if freaking looks like something very old school, it actually seems to be something very actual and uh, still having some interest from for, uh, for actually uh, bad actors because as an operator, as working in an operator, I can believe me, we have actually one GUI attacks almost every day. And the operator uh, efforts to remediate the situation and the investment actually in all this uh, uh, fight against actually bad actor uh, doing freaking is quite high to protect actually the customer against this kind of threat. But at the end, the best protection provided by actually the against this threat is of course the end user behavior because end user remained the the bad act, the best the best um, protection uh, method and the the end user means me you everybody and the behavior that we can have uh, with actually our personal identifiable information with actually reacting with actually messages uh, calls and everything so then I would advise you as a recommendation to keep your phone usage safe. So then if you recognize actually a weird number or a suspicious number calling you back, uh, asking, actually asking to calling you back, so one ring call, never call back suspicious number or number that you don't know, uh, which come from a country that you don't even actually know the existence. Keep your PII secret as much as possible. Because actually, you can see that the SIM swap is very actual. It can even actually touch uh, the most protected, supposedly, <laughs> uh, the most protected person uh, actually uh, in the world. And actually, this uh, is quite important. So this is a question of your security to keep actually this uh, this uh, informa personal information secret as much as possible. And also, and this is also a recommendation. I didn't have the time to talk about it, but Please use a uh, legitimate store, Apple Store or Google Play, because um, actually these applications, sometimes if you use application outside the stores, it can actually hide some malware, which actually contains some uh, malicious code to do communication on your behalf and then to conduct to some fraud. And in case you are seeing actually a loss of service, an abnormal loss of service, meaning that you have a uh, network and suddenly you have not, nothing, actually no network, uh, you lose all your service like that, uh, then contact uh, your operator uh, in emergency. Because actually, in case you see this abnormal, this probably means that you were victim of a SIM swap. So thank you very much uh, for this presentation. This is time to hang out, of course, and uh, I will be pleased to answer uh, your questions, if any. Thank you. Okay. 
Yes. Because uh, because actually this phone numbers, this IPRN come some, uh, sometimes actually from countries where actually there is some lack of uh, regulation uh, by this by doing this use. So I can I cannot give you actually a list of countries, but if you go in a country in the in the Pacific or uh, actually in a in another continent. Uh, in another continent, so then actually there is no, uh, there are regardless uh, towards the law. So it means that there are regardless if actually a number in the Pacific is used to commit actually a fraud in Luxembourg. And this is basically actually the threat behind is that uh, of course it is just doing some bad things by using actually this uh, fraud. But at the end, the money goes, uh, of course, actually in this country, and then actually this fraud. Uh, remains actually possible as long as there is some lack of uh, um, of uh, at, actually of a lack actually of uh, awareness in regards of the fraud committed in these countries. So there is actually some legal aspect in this country which are quite lacking and regardless of what we are doing with this fraud. Still not. Now it seems to work. So thank you for this. The, the second question is, um, we have been dealing with a lot of IRSF fraud cases. Um, something no one ever could explain is how it is possible that IPRN providers can offer test numbers from different countries like NIUE as um, IPRM numbers and this without the knowledge of the NIUE local responsible provider and IRSF has to be solved by the providers. By the, yes, of course, actually, the, the problem needs to be solved uh, in the source. Uh, in, of course, actually, in case this uh, fraud happened, the provider actually of the IRSF number uh, is actually the key solution of, uh, the, uh, of actually to contain this phenomenon. And that's the reason why actually I listed this uh, uh, this number of 12 billion per year annually uh, to fight again the, this actually type of crime because at the end there, there is this is a crime there is a network behind and some sometimes actually the provider itself in actually the IRS S I R S F actually there is uh, of course actually good like actually seems swap uh, some people which are honest, honest and wants to do things the right way but uh, you are not actually um, protected against actually insiders, which actually also wants to get part of the money out of this actually fraud committed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, no more questions from the, the online audience. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I had a question. Yes. So you need to uh, use, of course, your uh, the phone of your uh, of actually your neighbor of, or actually another phone. Of course. Sorry, thank you very much. Sorry. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, so pay attention to your phones. I would say otherwise you can, they can make you pick you out. So our next speaker is Steve Miller from Be Secure. And he will speak about the human antivirus and everything that comes with it. So please give a welcome to Steve Müller. So welcome everyone. Um, so my name is Steve Müller. I'm from Be Secure, the Cybersecurity Awareness Center. And just in case you don't know us yet, so we explain our mission is to explain cyber risks to the population and uh, to give advice on how to use the say modern technologies in a secure way um one thing i i should should say before i start is uh, when i picked the title at the beginning of the year i did not make the link to the current situation so this is pure coincidence i mean it really is but it's kind of funny one um <clears throat> so uh how, how does it how do i get this title I often get asked by people, yeah, hey, I'm using this antivirus, but 
uh, is it really good or do we have any re recommendations on what's the best antivirus? And I do not really like the question for various reasons. So what I usually do is I, I keep telling people, well, the best antivirus is actually you. That confuses people. <laughs> so uh, what I'm trying to do is a bit explain today what, what I mean by that. <clears throat> but before I, I get to uh, the um, to explaining what an antivirus is and why you are the best antivirus, let me just briefly explain what a virus is in, in IT. So most, more generally, I, I like talking about malware. And there are kind of three types of malware that exist. And for each kind, I mean, it's a bit different how you can get it as well. So you have the classic virus, uh, which everyone speaks about, but you also have the Trojan horses and wolves. So the virus is a very classic one, and I mean, I do not really have to explain what a virus is in biology. Um, but uh, so just briefly, a, a virus is a particle that floats around that someone gets into your body, and um, it tries to attack one specific cell of your body. So cells, as you probably know, have a nucleus. Nucleus have a DNA that kind of tells the cell what's, what its function is. And the virus puts itself onto that cell inserts its kind of DNA code into the cell as well that tries to modify the cell and the way the cell functions. And the goal of the virus is obviously that it tries to replicate itself. During that process, the cell is, all, is often destroyed. It's why you get sick. And in IT, in fact, the very same principle holds as well. So here, you, the virus itself is a document, and in fact, a document, for instance, a Word document. Um, it gets activated, so it gets into the computer in various way, usually by mail or by download, sometimes also by plugging in a malicious USB stick. Um, and it gets activated always by you opening the document. So as long as you insert your USB stick, nothing happens as long as you click the document. This is important. Now, when you open it, so Word opens, the host program opens, and uh, it's modified in such a way by the virus that it tries to infect other documents in the computer and then tries to spread itself by sending itself again via mail or instant messaging or through the network, it depends. <clears throat> now, this is a virus. What's important here is, again, uh, you click it in order to activate it. The second one, it's very similar. It's called a Trojan horse. And you probably know the story of the Trojan horse. I mean, the Greeks hiding into the horse that they're trying to give as a gift to, to Troy um, in order to, to enter the city. And Trojan horse in IT is exactly the same principle. Usually, you download software from the internet. Uh, how does it work? Well, you go to some website, you download it, um, you install it on your computer, you click it, and it will open. So no, nothing surprising here. If you download a malicious software, a Trojan horse, the very same thing uh, is actually true. So you go to a website, you download the software, you believe it's the real software, you open it, or you install it, you open it, the program also launches. So for you, nothing has changed. The only difference is that in the background, you also installed an additional small software um, that tries to scan your computer for, let's say, interesting information. And this interesting information is, for instance, passwords stored on your computer, maybe banking information, maybe secret documents. Um, and the goal of a Trojan horse is always to stay undetected for as long as possible. Because if it's undetected, I mean, it can uh, scan your computer for a longer time. Uh, here, important as well, you activate it by installing it, by opening it, so by clicking it again. Now, there's a very last example, which is fortunately a bit uh, rarer, it exists. And that's a worm. A worm tries to exploit a vulnerability that you have in your computer. Um, the vulnerability here is symbolized for the crack in the uh, computer screen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so you get a worm exactly like you get all kind of malware via mail, via download, and so on. What's it's on your computer, it tries to scan on its own the network, for instance, uh, and looks for other vulnerable computers. If it finds any, it replicates and spreads to those. If those are vulnerable, well, the same process continues and so on until every computer is infected. Now, this is not always the case via just network cables. It also works by, by spreading via Bluetooth, by mail, 
sometimes even uh, instant messaging software. I mean, some of you might have seen this already. You get a Facebook message from supposedly your friends. They send you a link and you click it and well, uh, they invite you to enter your password and stuff. So this is also some kind of a kind of a norm. Um, what can you do about worms? Well, it's basically the security updates that are always uh, uh, when the phone bothers you. Hey, do you want to install the security update? And say, yeah, well, not now. Well, please do that because if you uh, apply the security updates and you get one of these worms, they are not able to penetrate your system. And here, the very same discussions as for I mean, vaccines also holds. If you try, if you apply security updates to apply vaccines. Um, then you're not only protecting yourself, but you're also protecting your colleagues that might still be vulnerable. So it's important in, in to know. So to summarize this a bit, um, they have these three different kinds. The very two, the, the two most popular ones are always activated by actually clicking. And well, <laughs> you see already why it's important, or why, how you can become a human antivirus in a certain sense. It's by just not opening every document. The only exception is Worms, but they're here again. I mean, you can install updates and feel more or less secure as well. Worms are also very good, so it's not so much of an issue here. Um, now, people tend to say, yeah, okay, this is too complicated for me. I just install an antivirus and it will protect me from everything. This is not really true. I mean, antivirus helps, but it also has its limits. Um, how, how comes? Well, First, have a look at this picture, that man riding on a, on a motor, motorcycle, and think for a moment, is this man allowed to ride there or not? Well, well it's, it's not so clear, right? I mean, the list does not exclude motorcycles, but obviously the person who put up this sign wanted to make very sure that, I mean, absolutely no one with wheels is allowed to drive here. It's just that, well, he forgot monocycles. Um, and an antivirus actually works the very uh, same, same way. It has a list of programs that it knows that they are harmful. Um, so if you open a, a document, let's say just the normal document, legitimate one, um, usually, well, you click it, word opens, and then the antivirus steps in. The antivirus blocks for a moment the execution of word, and then processes its huge list of all known malicious document software and checks if it is on that list or not. If it is not, well, fine, then it allows words to continue its execution and open it up. If, however, you have a malicious document on your computer, the very same thing happens. You open it, you click it, the enterprise blocks word, uh, runs through its lists, and then at some moment it will identify something, say, oh, I have seen this one, this is known to be malicious, and then it will warn you. I mean, it will block the file, it will put it in quarantine, it will delete it, it depends on the other side. Coming back to the question, well, which antivirus is now the best one? Well, given the fact that well, antivirus are not perfect in the sense that if it's not on the list, it will not detect it. Um, it turns out that, well, there are many different antivirus solutions and not every solution detects every virus. I mean, they are different for, for reason because they're developed by different companies with different knowledge. And there's a useful site, actually, it's called the Virus Toto, um, which allows you to upload any file and it will scan it with all, more or less, all known antivirus solutions. And this is pretty useful because, as you can see here already at this example, um, when I uploaded some example file, well, only, only in a sense, nine of them detected it as a virus. Now, this makes you think, okay, well, then I just pick, I mean, one that detected it, so I should be fine. But if you repeat this exercise for a different file, you will notice that well, this program will not probably detect it. So it's, it's very difficult to argue. What's even worse is that criminals also use this site, for instance, to test if the virus that they just developed is actually detected by any antivirus solutions. So, and if it is, they just modify it slightly until it is no longer on any of these lists. And uh, then virus total says, hey, no antivirus solutions has recognized the file. And then, then it's the moment when they actually spread malware. So most malware nowadays is actually spread um, without any antivirus solution 
detected it. And if you know this, well, I mean, it's very difficult to argue that antivirus is something that really helps you, at least in the very first days uh, when you use it. That's why one often speaks of zero day exploits, because that's uh, the moment when actually no known solution exists for uh, a, a malicious site. Um, so the conclusion should be don't just rely on antivirus. I mean, it's good for anything that's already known, but for all new kind of viruses, it's not really relevant. Um, a very a linked question to this is, well, I, I mean, most of us nowadays use smartphones, and the situation on smartphones is really, really different because smartphones nowadays, they are uh, designed in a much more secure way than our classic smartphones in the sense that a program, including viruses, they cannot do just anything that they want like we do on computers. The security on smartphones is organized very much about permissions. So um, a virus cannot just read your passwords. It cannot just delete your files without asking you for permission. Um, the problem with antivirus solutions, especially on smartphones, is that they have to stick to these security rules as well. I mean, for instance, in antivirus, I mean, there are antivirus apps in the app stores, but they cannot just detect viruses in real time. What I showed you before is you open Word, the antivirus blocks the execution of Word. This is not possible on a smartphone. And also, they cannot block the virus or even delete it while it's being executed. Knowing this, well, an antivirus app, what does it actually do on a smartphone? Well, all it can do is you have a button, you press it, and it scans your file system and sees if there is any virus on it already. But then it's kind of too late already, right? So it's important that actually it's scanned, the, the, the apps are scanned before they get to the smartphones. And this is what every app store does. So the official Android app store, the Apple app store, they do scan apps before they get to the app store. Um, so actually an antivirus is not really needed in, in that sense. Is, do you always download apps from the app store or do, or do you also download apps from let's say other places? Most of us probably don't, uh, except that, uh, for instance, maybe heard from the battle between well, Epic Games and Android and Google. Epic Games is the, the uh, developer of Fortnite, a very popular game among children. And uh, they do not want to pay the 30% commission that every app developer has to, to give Apple or Google uh, when they publish apps in the App Store. So they decided to do kind of their own App Store if you want. So what you have to do is you go to their website, you actually download an APK, which is an Android package, so the software itself. Um, and Chrome, the browser, actually warns you, no, this is an insecure source for an app. Please don't download this. It exposes your smartphone to security problems. And well, they really explain you on their website that you should actually go to the settings, allow Chrome to download this stuff, and uh, then the phone asks you again, are you really sure you really want to do this? And then so people say, yeah, just give me the game. The problem is once you do this, you uh, expose your phone to other malicious software that you can get to your phone without going to the app store, so without going through an antivirus scan. So if you really want to do this with Fortnite, I mean, I cannot just like, prevent you from doing this, but if you do this, please disable this uh, setting that you enabled before after you installed um, well, viruses on computers and smartphones, you often get them on the phone via, via mail. Um, so it's kind of important to not only rely on the virus or your human kind of healing, but also detect it already in advance. So how do you detect a, a malicious or suspicious mail? I can show you a few tricks. So one of them is the uh, sender of the mail. For instance, in this site, it says, well, they are from PayPal. Mm, as you see already from the sender, it's do not reply at newsletter.com.au, so it's not really PayPal in a sense. And also, if you hover with your mouse over any links, uh, it will show you the address where it heads to, and there also you can already see if it's the genuine website or not. So how do you read an address? I'm not sure if you know this, so I'll just briefly go into that. So an address always uh, consists of three parts. The first one is the HTTP or HTTPS part, which basically tells the computer, hey, this is a link. Um, 
The second part is the name of the server. So, uh, you know, every service is somewhere on a server on the internet, and this part identifies, I mean, the physical machine that's somewhere on, on the internet. You can find this part by just scanning through the address and finding the first slash after the HTTPS. And, and everything that's after the slash is kind of the page on the server. So if you want to know if an address is trustworthy, all we need to do is to check if you're on the right server. Because once you're on the right server, we don't really care so much on the page because we trust the server. So the important part is actually everything between the HTTPS and the first slash. Now, for historic reasons, you read this address from back to forth. This is a bit unconventional, but okay, it's like that. Um, and well, the first part is the, the com. Com stands for commercial company, um, and it basically means well, this is a company. Now you go to the second part, it tells you it's Google. Okay, so we know it's a commercial company, the name of the company is Google, and you can repeat this process. So where on what page on Google is it? It's a subpage called Maps, but it's Google Maps. Now question to you, please think about it uh, for a minute. Do you trust this link? Would you click it in the name? Let's do the exercise. We have the HTTPS slash slash, which look for the first slash. And then the first token about it is UK. UK stands for United Kingdom. Okay, so good. CO in this case also stands for commercial company. It's because how we, the internet was developed. So uh, the British also wanted to have this com and gov and biz like the Americans did, but the Americans did not allow them to use their ones. So it's a bit complicated, but whatever. Um, and then, okay, we know it's a company in the UK. What company is it? It's Amazon. Do we trust Amazon? Okay, maybe this is a bad question to ask, but would you trust the link? Yeah, in this case, yeah. I mean, it's fine. We're, we're with Amazon. Now for this one. What do you think of this one? Same exercise, where's the slash? Okay, we have the CO. CO stands for? Now it's the trick. It does not stand for company. It stands for Columbia. And this is one of the tricks where criminals try to deceive you. Uh, it's, well, they have this CO, you have the CO UK, but you have the COM for original ones. So people get confused. And this is one of the, the things where they want to talk to. Last example, this one. Well, same exercise, we look for a slash. First one is commerce, commercial company, so good. Oh, what company is it? Payments. Okay, yeah, well, why not? What subpage is it? It's PayPal. Ooh, ooh. Now we have to pay attention a bit because how likely is it that there's a company called Payments and that has a service that's something offered with PayPal? Um, now we have to, it, it, it's kind of a risk analysis that we need to do, but is, is it really a company that offers PayPal services or is it a company that tries to deceive you by putting PayPal in its name? In this case, it's very uh, well suspicious because there is a page called paypal-payments.com. So the chances are high that they are trying to deceive you in this case. And they are, actually. Um, so it's not always important to see if the mail is suspicious, but I mean, they're also sending attachments to this. So how do you detect a suspicious or malicious attachment? Among these files, which one would you argue are dangerous? For the first one, PDF files, is it dangerous or not? Well, it is. <laughs> it may be. Uh, PDF is a very old standard, and it has a lot of nice features, like for instance, scripting possibilities. You maybe know that from the text declaration. It's fields that are automatically computed. Well, this automatic computing, computation is uh, made possible by scripts. Scripts are small programs. Um, and here it's important to note that the same is true for Office documents, but there you have a kind of protected mode. You can also enable this protected mode, which disables all malicious scripts and PDFs, but it's not enabled by default. So I invite you to go to the preferences in the security uh, tab where you can enable this. Now, a second example, clickme.js. Would you trust this one? <laughs> well, <laughs> the name already is very suspicious. I think this is highly dangerous. JS is JavaScript, and these are exactly the scripts I was talking about in the PDFs before. Now for uh, Excel documents, as I said, documents always kind of 
uh, potentially dangerous, especially if it comes from a stranger. Uh, fortunately, you have the protected mode, but still be a bit uh, uh, zip files. This is very different from like 10 years ago because nowadays zip files are pretty secure. So a zip file is nowadays very safe to open. Uh, I must add though that within a zip file, there are other files which are still possibly dangerous. I mean, for each of these files, you have to redo the exercise. And the last example of this presentation looks like a PowerPoint. But I mean, it's the very last extension that counts, in this case, an XA. So XA stands for executable. This is a virus. So please don't open this one because this is kind of cool. So the rule of thumb is kind of images are fine, zip files are fine, except for their content maybe. Documents are potentially dangerous, so always be uh, suspicious when, when uh, documents are attached. And anything else is dangerous, just don't open it. If something is unclear, just a Google search, I mean, you will find it. Now, the ultimate goal of hackers is always trying to get access to your account. Um, if you have passwords stored on your computer, the password can be as strong as you as one, it can be 16 characters or more, but if someone steals it from your computer, well, it has the password. Now, luckily, there are solutions, you know this from your web banking, for instance, where you just, just don't put in a password and a username, but you have this Luxtrust token. And well, this is great because if someone steals your password, it still cannot access your web banking because he needs your physical token. Now, I say this is great, but why doesn't this exist for mail or Amazon or social media? Well, surprise, it does. It's called two-factor authentication. It's an app which produces just like the Luxtrust token, it produces a six-digit code, which you also enter in your login. Um, these apps are free to get. There are multiple uh, examples on the App Store. I mean, just choose any, they're called authenticators. Um, if you install them, it's also pretty easy to, to set them up. So you go to the web page, for instance, social media or Amazon or Facebook, um, you go somewhere to the security settings. It's often a bit hidden, I must admit. But there you find the two-factor authentication, sometimes called two steps verification. Uh, you enable it, it will present you a QR code. And then you open your smartphone app, you press the push uh, the plus button, you scan the code, and you send. I mean, it's just as easy. So really please do this. It, it it increases security a lot. Okay. So that's a very brief summary of what you can do. So think. Uh, please remember malware, you only get it by downloading email or USB. You activate it by clicking it. So this is the human antivirus part. And antivirus itself is not perfect because, uh, well, the lists are not complete, especially in smartphones where you cannot really do a lot of things. Make sure that you don't open dangerous files, only download apps from the official Play Store and verify links in emails by doing a small exercise with the domain name. You can always use strong authentication, think about enabling protected mode for documents, and have an antivirus because it's always good in situations where we're a bit tired, we don't pay attention. It's good to have an antivirus in place, but don't rely on it in the first place. Just use it as a backup solution. If you have any questions, I mean, feel free to ask someone or send me an email. And also, if you have technical questions, there is a BCQ helpline which you can uh, ask at any moment. It's free, it's anonymous. And they are very nice and kind people that are always uh, happy to, to ask to answer your question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. You are, the question was, are QR codes safe to scan? Uh, it depends a bit on your app, but most apps actually scan the QR code and present you the content of it. So the QR code only contains information most of the times text or a url as long as your app just displays the url and you can see what the content is it's safe because nothing happens now obviously there again you see a url you see an address same exercises for email you'd never know where the address uh, leads to so you have to do the exercise again to address this uh, url or not what adds to this fact is that often uh, like uh, address shortening services are used for these URLs. So it's uh, you, if you have a very long address, there are services that kind of give you a, like, I mean, Bitly is for instance an, an, an example, where you don't see where the actual address leads to. So this is always a bit dangerous in that sense. So you have to pay attention to that. Yeah, right.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was, uh, even within protected mode, are you perfectly safe? No, unfortunately not. Um, so in protected mode, uh, the, the program is executed in a virtual environment. So whatever happens uh, to your program sticks within that virtual mode, so you cannot access your files, for instance. It's not perfectly safe in the sense that uh, if you have a really sophisticated virus, it might break out of this virtual environment. Um, so you still have to pay attention. I mean, if you, if you get a PDF or a document from a very suspicious place, please don't open it even in protected mode. But security is, is strengthened a lot. I mean, like scripts are disabled, uh, some kind of old features are disabled, which are uh, a source of many security holes. But these as just for antivirus, just don't rely on it. Mm -hmm. The question is, if you, uh, no, I'm repeating this for the end. Um, the question is, if you download anything and you put it in a virtual machine and there you execute it, is it safe on your machine? Ideally, everything that you open in a virtual machine stays in your virtual machine, unless there's a security vulnerability for this virtual machine uh, software. So that's usually safe. There's just one thing that I should add. Um, viruses nowadays, they can recognize if they're executed in a virtual environment. So what a virus often does is it checks Am I in a virtual environment? And if I am, then I do nothing. Because then the user believes, okay, it's safe to execute. He copies it onto his real machine, opens it there, and there the device actually gets active. So you have to pay a bit of attention there. Sorry, is it? It's, uh, I mean, is it possible to detect the virus in the virtual machine already? Um, this is a usual game of cat and mouse. I mean, um, yeah, it is possible. There are possibilities to that, but then hackers also manage to hide them again. And then there are possible other possibilities to detect them. And you can never answer this question. Um, I, I would not rely on it, but I mean, obviously progression is made both on the security side and both on the criminal. Mm -hmm. The question is, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about prevention here. What do we do if we get infected? Um, that's a, a very interesting question. So if you get infected by any malware, the best thing you can do is put your computer as soon as possible, put it into standby mode. Standby mode in a certain sense is better than turning it off because in standby mode, a professional can still extract useful information. For instance, if you have a ransomware attack, these are those attacks that kind of encrypt your files and ask you for ransom in order to get them back. If you have such an attack, then the encryption key might still be in memory and the professional might still be able to extract it. Um, obviously, this is anyhow, if it's that far, then, well, you kind of do it. Um, what's good is here really you work in prevention, have backups of your files in advance so that uh, if you have an infection, the only, let's say, uh, secure way to get rid of an infection is to reinstall the machine. Then you can be absolutely sure that there are no traces left. I know that antivirus solutions have possibilities to kind of clean your computer. I do not trust these because I still think, yeah, I mean, how can I be sure that there's only one virus and that the antivirus did not detect all the other traces? Mm, I, I always delete machines afterwards. But yeah, of course. Um, um, mm -hmm. Okay. Now, we have two questions from the, the online audience. The first one is uh, regarding PDF. And uh, what happens if you have a LuxTrust COSI signed PDF and can it still be hacked or not? If you have LuxTrust, um, it says here COSI signed PDF. So I guess a signed PDF yeah. using the, the LuxTrust technology. Yeah, I mean, the question is uh, for COSI signed PDFs. So that's kind of a, a signature with your LuxTrust uh, token. 
and it still be hacked. I mean, this is not really related because uh, a Luxtra's signature just uh, tells the person that opens it that this is a legitimate document and it has to be digitally signed. This is not related in any way to I mean, security uh, problems. You can perfectly sign a document that's kind of malicious. Thanks. And uh, the second question is um, what you explained for PCs uh, is, is basically for PCs, um, but uh, what about if you are using a Linux PC? Well, this is the old discussion. When I talk about PCs, I often have Windows in mind because I mean most user, most people use Windows nowadays. And then there's the old discussion: Is Apple computers is are they more secure than Windows computers? And same is true for Linux. The thing is, um, there are security features in Linux and Mac that did not exist in Windows. Windows has improved a lot, especially with the uh, UAC, the uh, user access control, user whatever. Um, so that uh, also under Windows nowadays, not everything is executed with admin rights. Um, the really, I mean, it, it is it is on Windows, but this is not due to the fact that Windows is per se more insecure. It's just due to the fact that there are less viruses for these platforms. As a criminal, I mean, you're developing a virus very specific for one target environment. And if on the one hand you have like 90% of the users using Windows and they're also I mean, less experienced than, for instance, Linux users who already by their nature pay more attention to what they open, um, then you're obviously targeting, I mean, these 90% where it's easier or where infections are more successful. But that does not mean that there are no uh, viruses for exploits for Linux uh, systems. I mean, especially in the server world, you see, a, a, I mean, a lot of attacks against Linux servers as well. Thank you very much. Uh, there is one. Ah, um, the question is uh, Windows Defender. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of Windows Defender because uh, nowadays, if you and starting from Windows 8, I believe, if you if Windows detects that there's no antivirus on your computer, so none at all. It will automatically enable Windows Defender. Windows Defender per se is a pretty good antivirus uh, if you well trust international benchmarks and so on. Um, but I should add that it is a pure antivirus, so it has only a list and uh, scans files when you open it. If it's on that list or not, it's pretty effective there. But it does not have all the might other other features that other products have. Like I mean, they can scan uh, other web services. They can uh, warn you about maybe uh, addresses that are known to be malicious. This is, I mean, that goes out of the scope of a pure antivirus, which Windows Defender is. But as an antivirus, it's a perfectly good solution. I mean, I use it a lot because most antivirus is a bit too slow for me, so I, I use the default. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So we are now coming to our next speaker, who is Thierry Degling from GovCert, and he will speak about the evolution of GovCert. Let's welcome Thierry Degling. Okay, so uh, hi, welcome everybody. Um, as you can see now, uh, this is how you export a university computer. So you send, the, send in a PDF, you tell them to just open it and accept all the conditions and, uh, and terms that, that, that apply. Um, now, th this is an archive PDF, so uh, it's a PDFA, so it doesn't have any scripts or animations. We don't do that at GovCert. Um, so let's let's go. Oh, there we go. So today we're going to talk about uh, the the evolution of threats that uh, we have been facing at as as a cert as a GovCert, but also as a country. Um, it's um, so previously you had worms, viruses, all these kind of attacks. But um, as I mentioned last year, I don't know if any one of you were here last year. Was there? You were? Okay, some speakers. Um, uh, Michael was too. Um, but um, 
some attacks are not only coming by the network. So you also have social attacks, um, attacks based on, on specifically made malware for uh, the constituency that, that we are um, responsible for. So this is why uh, we have we had to evaluate a bit, a bit to, to introduce new features as a cert. So all the kind of threats that uh, I explained last year, so uh, we have automation uh, for intrusion detection uh, to, to go through uh, a whole bunch of logs. Uh, and we also have the sensors like honeypot sniffers. And last year I talked about the users, which are like kind of the most important sensors that we have as uh, as a governmental cert, because they send in a lot of stuff that we have to verify, validate, and tell them if they're okay to open or not. But this year, we're going to talk more about the active testing part. So um, active testing can be done using vulnerability scanning. So we've had that for a whole, a whole bunch of time now. So meaning that if services from the government want to go online, we have a scanner that has to go through it uh, in order to make sure that it's safe to go online. But now we have uh, noticed that scanners are not humans and um, scanners don't see everything. So we introduced a new branch at GovSeed called the penetration testing branch. But what is penetration testing, right? Um, are you all just writing down everything that's on the slide? Okay. Um, so, uh, penetration testing uh, can, can obviously do more than, than a, uh, a computer does an automatic scan, right? Um, but it, it was also a demand from the constituency um, to, to have new ways of uh, attacks introduced because they can see that there are attacks coming from outside, but they want to be able to face these threats before they go online or before they publish a service. So this is why we do that. There's also a lot of willingness in the government to continue testing. So once uh, we have had an, um, a successful intrusion into an, an application or a network-based uh, uh, system, um, there's also a, a huge willingness for us to continue uh, to, to fight uh, that application and in order to, to find everything we can. And often enough, they do that as a follow-up. So they want to know if they have um, successfully patched uh, the, the, the vulnerability that we found, but also make sure that while they were patching it, they were not opening up something else. So we offer uh, a lot of bunch of tests. So the network-based, it's uh, mostly on, on web applications that we do the tests, but we can also do social engineering. So using, uh, I'm not saying we're going to, to copy SIM cards, right? But we can, we can call people um, using numbers and then make sure that people are aware that they're not going to give out information that they should not give out. Uh, and we also do vulnerability exploits. So uh, once we get aware uh, or become aware of, uh, of exploits that could be harmful to uh, systems running in the government, uh, we can actually exploit those uh, in order to um, to check whether or not the patch has been successfully applied by uh, the constituent. So the main reason why we do that internally is because there is a lot of sensitive information that could leak out um, before a uh, a software or a system goes online. So we have put that internally so we can run all, all of these tests before we go online or publish anything about, about new systems or, or servers. Next topic uh, that I had on, on the agenda was uh, big data. So big data is just, you know, like a buzzword. Everybody uses that as like blockchain. You, you just throw that out and you've got everybody's attention. I just Notice that now because you're all looking at me now. You were looking at your on your computers just seconds ago, but um, you know, like at the government, we collect a lot of lot of data. So there's a lot of uh, logs, a lot of information that is collected in order to be able to um, find threats even um, after 
they have come through the network. So if we get if we become aware of a threat that has been noticed in another country or um, from another cert in Luxembourg, we can actually verify whether or not we have seen that before in our networks. But that comes with some problems, right? You, you can't just throw hard drives at it and then just store everything. So we need to find something that is scalable, uh, highly available, and, and doesn't lose any data. So we came up with a, um, a, an open source project called Apache Kafka, uh, which is uh, our main pipeline to uh, run all the data through. So I don't know if you know Kafka, so I'm going to explain it a little bit. So you've got a, a few producers. I can't just turn around, but um, so you have producers. So a producer is always a, a lock source. It's something that gives you information. These all just put, they throw the, the logs at a, a cluster that just takes all the data in and classifies it into topics. So you can have a topic called firewall logs, uh, email logs, whatever. Uh, and then you have consumers. Consumers are actually like the, um, those are going to be the applications that we as a cert use in order to go through the logs. So the Kafka cluster is only taking the, the, the data and piping it, pipelining it to the applications that we are going to use uh, later on. So how does a cluster, how does a topic work? So you actually have a producer that writes through like to uh, three partitions in this case, that so just rotates over all the partitions and, and writes data into it. Because, you know, this is massive amounts of logs coming in every second. And then you have, in, in this case, you have three brokers, so three servers. And as you can see, for example, here, the producer first write something to the partition one leader, and then you'll have brokers two and three who are going to copy that information to themselves. Um, same goes for the next part where it's going to write something to broker three and then broker one and two are going to copy that from, from server three. So this makes sure that it is highly available and it's fast because you can write through uh, to multiple servers at once and the others are just going to sync that information back. So it, it takes a little, a little peaks. Um, but this is also transaction based. So if you have a producer that pipes information to our clusters, um, it will actually know if the data has been written to all the servers. So it's, for example, if one server would fail, let's say here broke one, you'd write something to it and you just uh, delete the data on your side and then broker one would just fail, it would not have replicated to the other two servers, right? So this is why we use transactions for that. So it, it's, it's only going to stop sending the information once it knows it's everywhere. What's great about Kafka here is um, you have one producer here that's uh, on, on level, like on the timeline, it's at, at number 12. So it's writing a new entry, right? But you have different consumers so these are consumers are different applications. So these can be um, applications that just read out the data, try to match it to a signature, to, for example, antivirus signatures. You can have something that um, puts it into a monitoring system in order to uh, visualize the data. And these are different applications, right? So they have different speeds at how they process the data. So what's great about Kafka is you can just write in all the, the entries that you have, and then you have the different consumers that are going to, when, when they say, I need the new data, it's just going to say, hey, hey, my name is consumer A, give me the, the rest of the data. And the Kafka cluster will know you are at offset nine, I will give you nine, 10, and 11, and 12 when it's ready. And the other customer, the other application with customer B, it will only say, I need the new data, and it will only be provided the data number 11. What's great about this is that um, we don't have to manage what application is at, at what offset. So Kafka does it for us. Um, what's also great about this is that you can go back. So if the application fails, you can reset the offset to, to a different, time, uh, di different point in time 
so you can um, re-push all the information into an application. I'm to back, coming to that now. So you, you have different customer groups. So let's say customer group A here, it would be production and customer group B would be testing. So if you have a new application when you want to test, you could just say, um, oh, I forgot that. This slide. We are going to keep the data in the Kafka cluster for a specific amount of time. So it's a buffer time-based. It's not going to check whether or not all the consumers have read everything. It's just going to keep the data for a specific amount of time. So right here, let's say you keep the data for one week and this represents terabytes of data. If you then go to a through a testing drive, so you have a new application when you want to test, you can just um, implement the, the Kafka consumer library and then tell the Kafka cluster, give me the data, set the offset to zero, and it will just through, uh, put the, the, the entire data from an entire week through the application. So you can test it with lots of data at once, and you don't have to um, copy and paste all the data somewhere and store it. So you always have kind of live data, and it's going to be like the data from the last week, let's say. Uh, what's also great about Kafka is um, it, it doesn't have lags in terms of replication. So uh, when the, the information comes in, uh, so you can see the hard drive on top, uh, it goes to the page cache, it goes right away to the NIC, so to the network interface, and it gets replicated to the other servers. And in parallel to that, it gets written to the, to the hard drive to make it persistent for, let's say, seven days. So this, this avoids time lags and, and replication um, fails and then applications waiting for transactions to end, like the producers. What's also great about Kafka is uh, you, you have zero downtime. You, you do not have downtime. It doesn't exist. So you have a cluster, you have multiple servers, and you will uh, update one server after the other. And um, while you are updating it, the leader will change. So the consumers do not know which server is the leader or not. They don't care. They just tell Kafka cluster, give me the data. And then these leaders or these brokers will then uh, define uh, within themselves who is going to provide the data to, to the consumer. So this allows updates without losing any information, which is critical for us. Uh, we also developed a small uh, Kafka tool in order to manage the entire thing um, because uh, there just wasn't a tool for that before. don't know why, but uh, it, it's just a command line tool in order to, to generate new topics, list the topics, um, insert some test data, stuff like that. And this is how it looks. So on the left side, you can see you have logs, metrics, NetFlow, whatever kind of information that you want to put through the different um, end applications that you can see around Kafka. We put that all through Kafka. So in order, if one of the applications at the end fails or has to be updated or whatever it is, we stop it. Kafka will still buffer all the information. And when we relaunch the application, it will just you know reconsume all the information and, and we have nothing that is lost. So as it states here on the advantages, you have zero downtime, you add as many clients as you want, you can restart everything and it absorbs large peaks. Like, as I said, you can, you can store days of information, not just minutes. But then there's the problem of the disk space, right? It still takes up disk space. Now it even takes disk space on two instances. It's on the Kafka cluster and on the end applications. So um, we were looking for something that, 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 that can scale, but that can um, contain all the, the information. It, it cannot strip out information. So we, we can't just ditch half of it and say, this is, we don't care about that. We don't know if we're going to care about it or not. So it, it needs to be um, speedy. It needs to be manageable. And it needs to, to contain a lot of information. So let's take 
some, you know, like regular JSON data, 1.4 terabytes, you know, everybody has that at home. Um, you, you can you can just compress that. Uh, if you compress it, you have like you have 480 gigs left. Uh, that's still a lot of information. But the problem when it's compressed, you can't search it, or you you can't search it quickly because your CPU would have to decompress it, search it, whatever it is, right? So you can't just go through that. So this is why we came up with ClickHouse. So it, this is not a tool that we built, um, uh, but ClickHouse can store the 1.4 terabytes of JSON in 515 gigabytes, which is still manageable, right? In, in terms of disk space, um, it's compressed, but you can search through it. I'm going through that now. It's it's very different. It's a very different approach from uh, if if you, for example, use Postgres or or MariaDB or MySQL. Um, it's a column-based approach. So we don't compress lines or rows. We compress columns. This means that it's it's a little harder to search for information in it. But for example, if you structure your data uh, correctly, you could say, I am searching for an IP address that is 1.1.2.4 within the time range of last six months and give and then tell it, give me back the rows that match another string to. It, it will then go through only the column of IP addresses, check the information, and then extract all the lines that have that IP address and only then go through those lines and search for the second criteria. If you go uh, through the uh, MariaDB or Postgres or the row-based approach, then you have to decompress the line because the lines are going to be compressed in the database. And you have to extract all the information from that line and then match that to the two criteria and only then give back the rows. So this allows us to, to go through terabytes of data within seconds and and it's it's super uh, super speedy and um it, it the only thing that i mentioned here at the last point uh which might be critical to to applications that you built so you can't just use it for your blog because it doesn't have full text search because it doesn't have indexes it doesn't exist so you, you, there's only this column based approach so if you have very structured data that you want to go through and you have massive amounts of them, this can be uh, the way to go. But it's not going to be maintainable or manageable if you have smaller applications where you just want to have a search functionality and go through uh, the information that you, you store. I think that's it. I might just be a little too fast there. No? OK. <laughs> OK, I'm, I'm too fast. Okay, so you have any questions? Was that too much? Okay. There's a question. Yeah. Um, so it's it's stored differently on the hard drive and it's compressed differently on the hard drive uh, or in the memory than, than the other. Uh, so for example, here, if you're going to search, so let's say you have, I don't know, uh, a source IP in the first column, a destination IP in the second column, a source port in the thir third column, and so on. You, ha you will have to say, I am looking for, um, Let's say you know of a bad actor that is trying to in, in, uh, go in, inside of your network. So you would search for the source IP being 1.1.2.4. And uh, you will also want to make sure that the destination port would be 443. So in that case, we would go through all of the data, only looking at one column, so the, the first column, check for that IP, then it would extract all these rows, it will, would extract the information of these rows, and then match that to the uh, second criteria. 
if you are on a um, a uh, so this is actually the the, the row based approach. This is a column based approach. Um, if you go to the row based approach here, uh, it would have to to match the um, the IP first and extract the entire line, but you don't do that in the column-based approach because you only extract the information that you want to see later on. So if you, on MariaDB, say, select these and those uh, columns, it will still have to extract all the information and then just return the information that you're looking for. But in this case, it will only extract the columns that you asked for and don't even look at the, the rest. So it, it, it won't touch them, it won't extract them. It, it might just be too much detail to go into now, uh, but you, you're welcome to have a look at it online. It's, um, it's very well described. And yeah, next question. So the question, I, I forgot to repeat the question before and say you did a great job at that. Uh, so the question is like, if you wanna have all the, um, the columns, all the information from a row, you would have to select all the columns. That is true. But you, often enough, you don't need that. Sometimes you want to um, refine your search later on. So, like, this is not, I'm not using, I'm, I'm not checking for a username and a hash password in order to log somebody in, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going through terabytes of data here in order to find something. Uh, so it's it's a different approach from from basic web applications. Any other question from the internet? No. Too complicated. Okay. Thank you. start with the next speaker, who is Michael Helm from Circle, and he will speak about the curiosity forensics. Welcome. So uh, this is about curiosities in computer forensics. And uh, I do everything in life now. Uh, if something goes wrong, I have my slides. But usually I don't just need the slides. I have a, a red line to show, uh, to remember by my own what I like to show to you. So I prepared this USB stick. I just connected it to my PC. And now I check what's on the USB stick. So you see, we basically have uh, some files, some text files on it. So let's take a look what's inside. Aha, uh -huh. some nice ASCII art. Another ASCII art. And another ASCII art, not very special. And what I show you now, this happens to me in the early summer. And uh, the first minutes, I could not believe my eyes. So let's see what happens. If we connect this USB stick to my Windows machine. Oops. So this will take some seconds. So here we come, it is recognized and we have our text files, yes? And now let's check what's inside this text file. Oh, no more ASCII art. Strange. <laughs> what's with the other two files? No. Again. Welcome to the CyberDay 2020 text. And again, another text, CyberDay 2020. So, okay, that's, uh, that looks spooky. <laughs> so let's remove the USB stick. Let's release it from the Windows machine, the virtual machine and connect it back to my windows. And we have back our ASCII art. So what 
is going wrong here? Obviously, something is going wrong. Well, let's investigate the USB stick. So, switch to my Linux, open the command line, and enter some basic commands. Yes, dmask minus t maybe to see how is the USB stick connected to my computer. So, you see basically it is device SDB. Okay. And how it is mounted. Here we see the device SDB is mounted on Media Michael CyberDay 2020. And it is partition one which is mounted, obviously. Okay, uh, there is a forensic kit, the SLUCE kit, and one of the tools in the SLUCE kit is uh, something like FDISC. Yes, you can list the partition table. So try this, MS. Def SDB to list the partition table. And now we see something not as strange. The forensic tool failed to read the partition table. That's scary too. Okay, let's use the standard tool. Fdisk minus L. Def SDB. And here we see we have a partition on the disk. So the Fdisk tool can read the partition table. And we see that the partition start somewhere at sector 140,000 and ends at 262,000 and something else. So basically, it's a 120 megabyte stick, uh, what should be one. And so the, the partition is on the second half of the disk. And open uh, the properties of the USB stick. Uh, we see that it is from the 128 megabyte, uh, gigabyte, which should be there, no megabyte, only 57 are assigned to the partition. So something spooky is going wrong. The forensic tool failed. So now I like to explain you what has happened. To understand what has happened, we have to go back to the early days in IT. Uh, you all look very young. Do you ever have something like this in your hands? That's called a floppy disk, yes. This uh, floppy disk is already a very new generation. Uh, it have a hard cover and it could store 1.4 megabyte roundabout. So at the 80s, we say we can put all our all information in our life on the floppy disk. Uh, but more important is how do the floppy disk works under the hard case? You have a plate, and the plate is divided into sectors. So the first sector, the sector zero on the disk, is the so-called boot sector. And the boot sector contains some uh, inf important information, which gives the computer the possibility to work with the disk. So, for example, how many bytes uh, is, are in a, in a sector? Do we have clusters? How many bytes are in a cluster and things like this. And after sector zero, the file system begins. If you check the sector zero with the hex editor, you see this information. So the boot sector needs the capability to boot up, continue the boot process. If it is a bootable disk, if it is a data disk, it don't need this capability. So here we see the first byte on the boot sector. It's very simple old assembler, which says jump to this address and then no operation. So basically, computer reads this assembler instructions, note the jump to address 52, increase the, address, uh, the, the pointer and start reading, executing here the boot code at this place. And this disk uh, we saw before, it's not bootable. So basically, what does the disk do or the boot code do? It displays the message that this disk is not bootable. Maybe you see this once on a PC, which boot from the one or which try to boot from the wrong, wrong disk. After this boot code 
here also some information you see in this bytes, this two bytes that offset 11 and 12. This two bytes contains the information how many bytes we have in one sector. So it's a 0, 0, 0, 2. This information is stored in so-called little endian format. So from the 0, 0, 0, 2, we have to flip the bytes into 0, 2, 0, 0, which is the hexadecimal value for 512. So this is a default standard. We have 512 bytes in one sector. And at the end of the boot sector, we have a, a sign, a kind of a symbol, a, let's call it a signature. Yes. The end of the boot sector signature. So that's basically all. That's the idea of the boot sector. Then later on, we got more hard drives, hard drives get bigger, and people say we like to have multiple partitions on a disk. So I try to illustrate this a little bit with some ASCII art. So this is our disk, our big disk. And on this disk, we have three partitions. And each partition has the volume boot record, which is basically the boot sector. And then afterwards, the file system. But now we need something else. Yes, we need the information. Where do the partitions start? And where do it end? Or how big it is? One of those. And this information is stored in something new, which is called the master boot record, which is now the first sector on the disk. This sector zero, the master boot record. So the master boot record have two jobs to do. If the disk is boot able, it must continue the boot process. If it is not, it's not necessary, then it's just a data disk. And it needs to store the information about the partitions. Where do they start? How big are they? The partition table. Uh, so here I have an example of a master boot record. And we see this boot record, this, this disk with this boot record, is not bootable. So there is no boot code, it's simply empty. Until at one point at offset 446, 446, which is exactly here, we start now here, which we start with the partition table. There is space for four partition table entries. Every entry has 16 bytes. So basically, here, this byte, the first byte of the partition table for the first partition table entry is 00. zero. If the disk is, uh, if the partition is bootable, it will be 0B. Zero then we have some other values. This 07 here, for example, tells that it is an NTFS partition. And here we have some bytes which uh, say where, defines where the partition starts and where the partition ends. Okay, what now, what I did with those strange USB stick here is, first I create the volume boot record style, the old style disk. I format the disk directly without a partition table. The formatting creates a volume boot record and all the rest of the disk is formatted. Then I create some text files, put it on it, and then with the hex editor, I create a partition table in the empty space of the volume boot record. So basically, I have now a mixture of a volume boot record and of a master boot record. I have both in one. I define in the partition table that there is a partition, and then I format this both partition with NTFS2, and I create my files on it. And now it's totally up on the totally up on the software, on the system, what it takes. Yes, you connect a stick, one system takes the volume boot record, the other system takes the master boot record. And we see also 
for systems, for Windows, for Linux. Uh, it depends on the system, what it takes from both. But at the end, it works fine. I call this a polyglot boot record because it's, it speaks more than one language. So that's for the first exercise. Okay, let's remove the stick from the PC and connect the next one. So I connect another USB stick to my PC and we see it have three partitions on it. Uh, let's investigate this stick a little bit more. So it is connected again as the SDB and we see that we have uh, one primary partition, yes, which is uh, basically an extended partition, and we have three logical partitions inside the one primary extended partition. Okay, let's see how it is mounted. So we have SDB6, it's Michael Circle, SDB5, it's Michael Test, and SDB7, it's Michael EFIR. Let's read the partition table. So we, again, we have a very small USB stick. Yes, uh, we don't like to wait 10 minutes uh, to process uh, gigabytes of data. So we only have 128 megabyte USB stick with three partitions of eight, 48 and 64 megabytes. That's time. And now I access the USB stick with my hex editor. Hex edit dev SDB. Okay. And I modify a little bit some bytes on the USB stick. But I don't need this. So I jump to a specific location. And so I jump to somewhere in the middle of the USB stick and I modify some bytes. One byte. Mm, right. Uh, three bytes and four bytes. I modify four bytes. I save. Save chance. Uh, yes. Oh. So I hope it worked. I will give you just to be sure. Yes, work. So I disconnect the USB stick from my PC and disconnect. And now we will see what happens. I don't understand. Oh, oh, that's not good. <laughs> ah, maybe it's no. Oh. It moves. Great. So, did you see the four bytes I change? Or <laughs> okay. So I 
can basically go to hex edit. Okay, I remove my. I take now the other stick because this is already modified. So let's take this one. And I can read more than one. So, so I jump to a location on the disk and I change three bytes. And so here you see everything is zero and I change a four bytes, byte number one, byte number two, and to be sure, Byte number three, eighty-eight, and one zero. Okay, that's all. Okay, so you see, I changed just four bytes on the USB stick somewhere, and now I remove it and reconnect. I hope you can see don't crash. Uh, mm. Nothing happens. No, it don't happen what I expected to happen. <laughs> it could happen in a live exercise. Uh, let's see. Uh, zero one, but you see, I open the hex editor again, and you don't, you don't set properly the modification. So, but uh, it's only uh, okay. Let's do eight eight zero one, like I have in my notes. Eight eight zero one. So once again, save. And control it, and let's do it again. Or maybe I make a sync or something that he write it to disk for sure. Okay, now you see something change. You already see it here in the Folder window. And the PC is a little bit slow at the moment. I cannot even move the window because he is mounting and mounting and mounting stuff. You already see, yes, it gets more and more. You know what happens. I resolve the storage problem of the world. <laughs> Endless disk space. Uh, with four bytes changing. Okay, I make some screenshots some before to illustrate how it looks after a while. Yes, everything is full with my USB stick new partitions. Incredible. It's still it's still very busy the computer. And yes, if you are here, you hear now the, the fan starts spinning. And so what happens? Yes, I just changed four bytes and we have this very crazy behavior. So let's investigate a little bit the USB stick command. Back to this. You see, we have millions, no, not millions, but more than 100 partitions mounted here. Mounted, many partitions mounted. Here, 100. And he is still mounting. Let's do another test. Uh, Uh-huh. 
Oh, do it. Pull up from there. We have many, many partitions. And let's try the forensic tools once again. MMLS, dev, sdb. And it's stuck. The forensic tool, the forensic tool stopped working. Okay. Time to resolve the question. What's going wrong? As you see, the USB stick have extended partitions. Yes, you remember in the master boot record, we only have place for four partitions, the four primary partitions. You cannot have more in the master boot record. If you want more partitions, you need to use extended partitions. So I create, an, in the master boot record, I created one entry, which says I want the extended partition uh, from the beginning to the end of the disk. So it creates a so-called primary extended partition, which is basically a placeholder for extended partitions. In the extended primary extended partition, I created the first uh, the first logic, the, the first secondary extended partition, which is basically here. And the secondary extended partition consists out of a new boot record, which is called the extended boot record, and the logical partition, which stores the file system. The extended boot record is totally empty. It just has two defined entries for one, two partition table entries. The first partition table entry points to the logical partition, which I can format, and the second one points to another secondary extended partition if I need more partitions. So we have a, se a second extended partition here, a secondary extended partition, which has again an extended boot record, which points to the logical partition inside. And if we want, it can point to a new secondary extended partition. In the new secondary extended partition, we have again an extended boot record with possibility for two partition table entries. And at one point we say it is enough. At one point we say it is enough. We don't need more partitions. So we only use the first partition table entry, which points to the logical partition. And the second stays empty for later. And what I do, I change the four bytes. I check this extended boot record, which points to the logical partition and to the secondary, the new secondary logical partition. And I copy those values, which points to this partition table and fill it in here at the bottom in this, in this boot record. So what I basically created was, I illustrated it here, a link back to this boot record. So I created a loop of extended partition table. And now I continue running until at one point the software say, okay, it's enough. I stop after 128 or 256 or something like this. That's the trick. That's all. That's the two. Uh, things I tested out, I'd like to show to you, and I hope you enjoy it a little bit. Thank you. Ah. So, um, somebody is wondering about the details. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. I stumbled over it. I had the issue that I have was confronted with this situation. Uh -huh. No, no, no. I was preparing some forensic trainings and I was uh, dealing with USB stick, wiping them, 
uh, creating partition tables using FDisk to you know, format them. And at one point, FDisk crashed. And after this, I had this behavior. And then I was, oh, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and Um, but one reason, one of my motivation to show you this is, you see in the two exercises that the both the times that the forensic tool failed to help you analyzing. And I think it's very important that you need to be able to read the bytes, to understand what's going on, uh, to read basically and understand this boot record, for example, because if you just trust the tools and they fail, at some point, because this thing is not expected by the tool, then you are lost. So that's one of the motivation to motivate the people to try to understand what's going on under the under the hood. Okay, no more questions. Oh, yes, uh, Terry already uh, picked some uh, ideas, yes. Uh, for example, uh, hiding a malware on one partition uh, could be an idea, which is not recognized if you scan it with your Linux tool, if you investigate it with your Linux tool, uh, you will not find it. And if you connect it to the Windows, uh, then it uh, get executed. But uh, it was not my intention to abuse this uh, somehow for <laughs> something. It was more to show that you should be able to read the bytes and interpret the bytes on your own. Some no more? Hey, then, thank you very much, Michael. No, thank you. <laughs> uh, so thank you for being here today. Um, and then coming to our next speaker, so, if we take a few seconds more, it's because we have to change the laptops again. But uh, the next speaker I would like to announce is uh, Cédric Moni from Tenandus. And he will give us some insights into the Luxembourgish uh, companies and how they manage their security. Agents. So please welcome with me uh, Cédric Moni from Tenandus. I'm Cédric Moni and I will present you uh, an infographic we did last year. In fact, uh, last year we, we asked ourselves how companies are managing information security incidents. We showed this infographic exactly one year ago during the last cybersecurity week. And at the beginning of 2020, we plan to, to do a new iteration. Yes. We plan to do a new iteration of of this survey, but unfortunately, COVID prevents us to do so. So I will reuse this presentation and give you some insight of, of what we, we saw in our incident forensics uh, projects we did for the last 12 months. OK. So we ask two companies how they, are, how they are managing information security incidents. We issued this survey by uh, an online form, and we collected uh, 40, 40, 42, 41 companies that are provided answers to our questions. And the companies were distributed in different economic sectors, different economic sectors and different size of companies. So we can we can consider the, the survey was quite representative of the, the current landscape of the practices in the management of security incidents. So we have to, to keep in mind, uh, we have to do, okay, we cannot do. Okay. And the first question we ask the company is, have you suffered from an incident over the last year? And 78% of the companies say they reported uh, they have to manage at least one incident over the last year. And we did the distribution between the different economic sectors 
the public, the finance, and the industry. Financial sector is said to be the most secure ones. That's probably one uh, one view of these figures. And the industry and services say they have to manage lots of incidents, or not exactly lots of incidents, but most of the companies have suffered from an incident. And last year, it was quite surprising that 22% of the companies said they did not have to manage an incident over the last year. That's quite a surprise for us. And according to what we saw from the beginning of this year, we can say it's not the case. Almost 100% of the companies have to suffer from an incident. That's sure. That's for sure. Especially because there are more and more vulnerabilities and actors are more and more willing to, to exploit these vulnerabilities. In addition, the, the lockdown that the lockdown that has been uh, ordered in uh, in last uh, in last spring open new capabilities and new opportunities for attackers to to break into companies by exploiting the remote accesses that has been provided to allow uh, remote workers. So, not all the companies said they have suffered, suffered from incident. Okay, that's one thing. And then we ask them what were the main causes of the incident. 84% of the companies said they, are, they suffered from an incident resulting from a social engineering attack. Social engineering, as said by Steve before, are exploiting the, the human factor. Social engineering attacks are exploiting the people, and that's the most efficient way for attackers to break into a company is not to break the systems, is to ask the passwords of users. So, according to what we saw, during the, the lockdown and starting in March, we identify a lot of spam and lots of malicious documents sent uh, by emails to, to employees, sent by emails to citizens. And these documents were most of the time uh, Word documents that are exploiting macro, mis misconfigured macros to, to break into the computers of uh, the, the people who are opening these uh, this macros. That's exactly what you said, Steve. It's in relation with the virus and the worms. The second categories of cause of incidents were the human factors. That's, uh, that, sorry, the human errors. That's all uh, in relation with the human factors. And the third one, according to the respondent last year, last year it was 19% of the respondents faced external technical attacks and hacking. That's less than one fifth of the company. And according to what we saw, since the, the beginning of this year, this figure should be uh, quite uh, bigger right now. Because companies are going to the cloud and companies have opened remote accesses for their employees. And beginning of this year, our security teams have to suffer from, uh, uh, sorry, our security teams have yes, suffered from the, the consequences of vulnerabilities on VPN gateways, on firewalls, and remote accesses because the most important vendors of these tools are, were prone to vulnerabilities that have been exploited later in the year. And technical attacks and hacking are exploiting vulnerabilities from the, the systems that are exposed on the internet. So that's very important for companies, but also for citizens in another, another approach to, to patch and to update their systems. Because attackers are professional right now, and they are using automatic automatic tools that are able to identify weaknesses on the gateways and to exploit these weaknesses to break into the companies. In several incident response we did so far, the uh, the root cause was a misconfigured VPN gateway on the internet because the company did not have patch. This, this gateway and attackers were able to, to break into the company. An attacker from, the, from any country in the world passing through the internet is going to get into the internal network of the company. So 19% of the respondents face to external technical attacks and hacking. Today, it, it's expected to be quite higher. Then we ask two companies, what are their self-assessment of their confidence in their capabilities. Capabilities in incident response start with the preparation and the ability to detect, to analyze, to contain, to eradicate, to recovery, 
and to learn from an incident. That's the generic, uh, generic life cycle of an incident. And according to our study last year, the detection capabilities, uh, companies were not so confident in their detection capabilities. Uh, that's something to, to improve. And according to what we saw in our incident analysis, the preparation of companies is not so good. Ransomware targeted lots of companies, and we saw some companies that they are not having backup in place. Companies sometimes are doing backups, but they are not testing it, so they are not able to recover their data. And sometimes their backup are also corrupted and encrypted by the ransomware. So the preparation has to be improved. And also from the recovery capabilities, according to our study, it was the, the domain in which companies say they are the most confident. But from a technical point of view, it's important to train to be able to recover because it's, it's possible to have backups, but it's different to have backups in place and to be ready to, to restore the backups. So about the impact of a security breach, according to our study, uh, the most important impact is the reputation. Okay, then the legal and regulatory, and finally the operation. We saw many companies that have stopped their business after uh, a ransomware attack because their operating systems were also corrupted and they were not able to, to restart their, uh, their production capabilities. So the operational impact can be very, very, very big for a company because the company will not be able to work anymore. I have to want to focus on one thing. From... Okay, I cannot do. We also ask if companies have a security incident management strategy in place. Half of the company says that we have such a strategy in place, and this strategy consists in containing the attack and preventing the expansion and preventing the recurrence of similar incidents. That's, that's quite good. But we can focus on the, the business impacts. Companies in their strategy do not address the business impact at the appropriate level. That's very important to get the support of the management of the companies to get to do a relationship between the incident strategy and the business impact. Doing security is fine, but doing security for protecting the business, that's exactly what the board of directors wants to have. Board of directors does not want to have security. Board of directors wants to have capabilities to continue to do their business. That's the most important thing. So our advice in this area is to do a mapping between the technical aspects of the security incident, incident response plan and the business of the objectives of the companies. Okay. One of the most important objectives of companies, to, uh, as according to the study, is to prevent the recurrence of similar incidents. But how to prevent the recurrence of similar incidents when the company is not able to know what is currently happening outside of the company. And that's exactly when it comes to the information sharing. Sharing information in the field of incident response is very important to be able to react appropriately to an attack. Sharing information when it comes to incident response allows allow the companies to get to be able to react before an incident occurs because you share information with other companies and if a company in the same sector than yours is, suffer, is suffering from an incident, it's, it's possible you will suffer from the same incident. And we ask the companies, what are the obstacles for information sharing? And most of them said the constraints of the compliance framework the lack of time to process or to contribute to indicators and the lack of information to share are the most important obstacles. But today, there is an important need of cost-effective approach in security and the sharing of, uh, of information in relation with the incidents 
on top of improving and optimizing the investment is also very valuable for reducing the time between the, comprom the compromission of the company and the recovery to the, to the, to the business capability. And finally, we ask company, uh, do you have a search uh, ma a management strategy in place? 51% of the company said, yes, we have a management strategy in place. But we ask them, do you have an incident response strategy in place? That's a more technical aspect of the strategy, providing the details on how to respond to an incident. And 61% of the company said, yes, we have an incident response strategy in place. That's good. That's, that means companies, uh, companies are considering to be able to respond to an incident or to have procedures to respond to an incident. Procedures, it's 66%. So companies say, okay, we are confident in our recovery capabilities. We have the strategy in place. We have a plan in place. And we have the procedures for responding to, to an incident. But when we ask to companies, have you tested your incident management procedures, it drops to 44%. That's, that's quite pity because companies said, okay, we are ready on the paper, but we are not ready in the reality. Companies uh, do not test their incident response capabilities at the appropriate level for, for being able to timely and efficiently react to an incident. This year, 2020 will be remembered as the year where every company will, will have tested their business and continuity plan. Because in March, uh, there is major, major event making the companies to, to move from the office work to the teletravail. And all companies have tested their, their continuity plans. But our advice is also to test in practical way to test the, the, risk, the, the incident response strategy. Because without testing it, it's impossible to be sure the company will be able to allocate the right resources at the right place to manage an incident and to recover to a normal activity. And finally, we ask companies, what are your plans of investment for the 12 months, within the 12 months? That's in blue. And most of the companies are said to say, okay, we will improve our proactive capabilities to be able to detect attacks before they strike the companies, to improve their detection capabilities, to be able to detect attacks that are currently opening and currently targeting to the company, and to improve the preventive capabilities to to reduce the attack surface and to, to prevent an attack to, to strike the company. So in a nutshell, that's what we, we learned based on the survey we did last year. And our key takeaways is for sure, Far more companies have to have suffered from an incident during the last month, and more and more companies will suffer from an incident in the coming months. And most of the, of the incidents are coming for, from social engineering attacks, so it's very important to, to secure the human firewall. It's important to increase the security awareness of people to train them how to react uh, and how to detect uh, malicious documents. It's very it's important to be sure and to, to be sure every employee in the company is informed of the correct way to, uh, to, to work and the correct uh, way to, to report on malicious documents within the company to protect. And to, that's very important aspect is to update and to fix the issues on the exposed systems of the companies because more and more attacks are coming from vulnerabilities of the VPN gateways and remote accesses. And 
to prevent recurrence of attack, information sharing is, is the key and it's very important for everyone to share and to get benefits from the share of information to improve its detection capabilities. And finally, security is continual improvement, considering, sorry, considering the prevention, the defense, the detection, the reaction, and the assessment of uh, its exposure to vulnerabilities. Thank you. Sharing starts with the trust and confidence. So it's important for companies to share in trust with peers. And for instance, especially in Luxembourg and globally, there is a platform named MISP, Malware Information Sharing Platform, that has been developed by Circle that allows companies from around the world to share IOC. IOC is an indicator of compromise. It's pieces of information in relation with an attack. For instance, uh, the title of an email, the, the hash, the, yeah, the hash of a file that allow to identify or from a unique way a given file. It's indicator of compromise that could be used like a website used for this, for, for phishing disseminations or malware, uh, malware disseminations. Sharing what we saw on our companies to other companies helps to prevent and to improve the detection capability globally. Attackers are sharing a lot. So defenders have, have also to share to prevent, uh, to protect the ecosystem. On the other side, if you are now a school. If you would like to share some information, you can share it with Christina Cicert and we handle it and we put it into the MISP platform if you'd like to. So this shouldn't be a problem at all. If you would like to have some information, just contact our CSERT and we will provide you information because we're also involved in the CERT LU community, such as we get from all the CERTs here in Luxembourg, we get the information. Since we are a trusted partner, I think all the CERTs, we can provide you the information you would like to have. Exactly. The CERT community is, is a peer group based on the confidence. And that's very important. And I think there are some more questions online. Yes, there's one online question, and that is, do you expect the numbers to change a lot in 2020? Yes and no. Yes, because uh, the current landscape and the sweat landscape is increasing, and attackers are, have more and more opportunities to, to target companies. So yes, figures will change, and they will increase. And no, because there is... Uh, uh, um, uh, some, some shame by saying, okay, we have been targeted by an attack. That's, that could be considered as a shame. And uh, have some, yes. uh, companies have to, yes, have to improve their communication and public relationship. We ask to companies, have your confidence in, in your capabilities to communicate on these incidents and know that's the worst results. 61% of the companies say we do not have high confidence in our capabilities to communicate. And communication is very important towards the public because of GDPR, for instance, if there is a, a sort of a privacy leak in the company. But communication, it's very important to, to provide details and to, to get confidence into the capabilities of the companies to manage the incident. So yes, figures will increase because the landscape is increasing, but it depends when, what uh, people want to, to share with the community. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, so your question is why is, why preparation is not uh, is not why companies are not so well prepared to to different events? It depends what we we said by preparation. Uh, for instance, before before March, how many com companies consider the risk of lockdown in their business continuity plans? For instance, almost none, because it's very low probability event with very high uh, high impact, so it's high high risk for the company. But the probability, uh, the risk, uh, the risk for the company by combination of probability and impact is quite low because the probability is low. So, so companies before. I said before, said, oh, I will not be targeted by an attacker because I'm a small company, I'm in Luxembourg, and nobody knows where the Luxembourg is on the map. Uh, I do, what I'm doing? I'm doing, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm doing very small businesses. I'm selling sandwiches. So I'm not of interest for, a, for an attacker. So I will not be prepared for that, for this kind of events, because my main focus is to, to sell my sandwiches. So I have no needs to, to prepare my company for, for an incident. But an attacker, it's, it's, import, it's interesting for him to, to break into a company that is selling sandwiches because the company is managing a list of customers. And customers are potential targets for social engineering attacks because we can do some very, very specific attacks by exploiting the name of the sandwich company. And people, because they are customers of the sandwich company, we we click on the link, and they will be trapped and on test on test to, to give their their um, their credit card number, for instance. For an attacker, it's very interesting to have a sandwich company uh, as part of his botnet because he can control the company and to use this company to send sp phishing, spams, and malware. So every company can be a focus for an attacker. And because companies consider themselves not be a target, they do not invest and they are not prepared. Okay, that's an extreme situation. But even for bigger companies, they do not consider the cyber risk at their top priority. And this is going to change. And most important change over the last months and last years is cybersecurity is a concern of the board of directors. And that's changed everything because yeah. without the support of the board of directors, security investment will not be possible. Investment in terms of money, investment in terms of time and resources in people. So this is going to change because the directors are going to change their mind on that topic. Thank you. Yes, okay, your question is why companies want to share data because uh, competitors can also access to this data? Because we are all interdependent into, uh, in, within the ecosystems. And we share also to receive data. And we receive data because other companies are sharing data. And as I said, attackers are sharing a lot of information on their, on their victims. So defenders of, including companies, have also to share to improve their capabilities to react. And the survival of a company depends of the, of the time elapsed between the compromission, the detection, and the recovery. And the sharing of indicator of compromise is using and very helpful to reduce this time frame. So why sharing? Because uh, you are not alone. That's the main point. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Internet. Thank you, Cedric, for your contribution. So we are now coming to the last speaker who will join us only virtually because he's located in Brussels. 
So I would like to announce uh, Leonardo De Vicio from the European Commission. We will talk today about the polit policies perspective on cybersecurity priorities for Europe. And I would say we just wait a few seconds until we have him here on the WebEx call. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Fine. Yes. And uh, can you see my screen as well now? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay, thanks okay, a lot. Great. So the floor is yours then. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot, first of all, for uh, for inviting me uh, to to this conference. It's it's a pity that I could not be there, uh, obviously because of uh, the restrictions related to COVID. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to be here today and to try to explain to you a little bit more what is the perspective from, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a wider um, uh, European cybersecurity policy uh, point of view. And uh, so this is what I, I will try to do. Uh, I understand we had uh, 45 minutes. Uh, in any case, uh, I will try to, let's say, uh, present the slides uh, um, faster in a way that, that you know, I can also receive questions and, uh, and I'll open the floor for your comments. So, uh, just an overview of what, I'm, or, uh, what I will present to you. Uh, basically, um, I will focus, uh, of course, on the main trends of, of action at uh, EU level. Uh, being, of course, uh, uh, boosting uh, uh, research and industrial capabilities. Also, uh, I'll give you a glance of what we do in terms of uh, regulation and uh, uh, resilience. And uh, uh, finally, I will also touch upon uh, uh, cooperation and how we see it develop uh, uh, in the future. Um, I mean, this all comes in the context, uh, of course, of uh, uh, the need to have a high level of awareness, not only from the cyber community, uh, such as you, but also from, from citizens, and uh, I would like at the end also to pick up on the fact that today is uh, October, so it's it's one of the days of the European Cybersecurity Month. This is uh, an annual um, awareness raising campaign that we run, and uh, um, and of course, you know, I, I invite you to, to spread the message further. So um, let's start from the threats, let's say from the scenario that, that we are confronted with from a policy point of view. Uh, I, I will uh, specifically also then touch upon COVID. Um, what, what we see right now, uh, what we see right now is actually uh, an increase uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, impact of attacks. Um, uh, we we, uh, we see from recent surveys the, the fact that uh, um, a large number of organizations have been impacted uh, uh, by uh, a security breach. Uh, we see that uh, a lot of crimes that are committed in member states are, uh, here it says, up to 50% uh, cyber crimes. Um, this, this trend probably is going to increase also in the future. I mean, we've seen already in the past attacks such as WannaCry, which have affected several sectors uh, from uh, automotive to, to health, and uh, which have led to 400,000 computers in over 150 countries. Why do I say that we see the attack surface increasing? It's because of the new te emerging technologies that are coming, uh, such as uh, uh, the Internet of Things, so the connected devices, uh, the increased uh, automation uh, that also attackers can benefit from, so the use of AI. Uh, and uh, just to share some data with you, uh, according to uh, some of the last information that I've seen, uh, Internet of Things devices will grow up to 20, um, 21 billion uh, just next year in 2021. Uh, at the same time, we also see some some weakness uh, from a preparedness point of view, uh, and also uh, some lack of skills that I think you're also aware of. Uh, some of the recent uh, estimation uh, um, talk about 1.5 uh, million uh, job vacancies uh, in cybersecurity worldwide. So, next slide. So against these, these growing threats that, that I just described, which of course have to also uh, be put into the context of uh, uh, growing geopolitical uh, uh, tensions uh, over the cybersphere. So the fact that uh, cyb the cybersecurity uh, dimension of international relations is, uh, is becoming uh, more and more uh, conflictual, if you want. So against this uh, landscape, what has the Commission done so far? Uh, I guess this timeline shows you uh, how much we've been uh, intensifying uh, our actions on cybersecurity, starting with 2013, when we re realized that uh, um, probably we need uh, an EU cybersecurity strategy. 
Since then, we had the uh, milestone of uh, having the first EU cybersecurity law, the NIS directive uh, adopted in 2016, uh, and then the cybersecurity package, package in 2017, which, which brought to um, uh, another important regulation being the Cybersecurity Act uh, adopted last year. Uh, moreover, uh, we have been proposing uh, the establishment of a cybersecurity competence center network and uh, we've been doing work also uh, on uh, the cybersecurity of, of 5G. So this is just a, a snapshot of uh, how much the um, policy work has been increasing uh, due to indeed the, the growing threats. And, uh, uh, and I mean, like I will explain uh, now uh, more in detail uh, what are the, the type of activities that we have carried out. Here again, uh, it's just a snapshot of uh, what was the rationale behind uh, uh, our uh, activities. Uh, the main goal, of course, is to build EU resilience to cyber attacks. And we mainly do it through uh, two channels, let's say, uh, capacity building. And, uh, but of course, capacity building can only do, uh, cannot solve all the issues. Uh, of, uh, in case attacks happen, uh, we still have to be uh, ready to uh, coordinate our response and to mitigate the effects of attacks. Capacity building uh, lies on, on some building blocks, uh, which are, of course, uh, uh, legislative requirements, or so reg regulation, at the same time, financial supports from the EU and the building of industrial capabilities. On the other side, cooperation is uh, very much happening both at, uh, at member state level uh, between uh, CSERTs and national authorities, but we also support uh, information sharing between companies through, uh, through ISACs. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, we also, um, encourage the uptake of uh, certification, cybersecurity certification. Now, it's important, I would say, to consider the fact that from an EU point of view, uh, cybersecurity is a shared competence with member states. So basically, uh, it's not an exclusive competence. This means that, that member states uh, can, and in most cases, uh, have legislated also uh, on cyber. And uh, uh, that's why uh, it's, it's necessary to have uh, uh, a balance between the national and uh, the EU action in, term in terms of policy legislation and so forth. Um, in terms of threats, uh, also uh, what we confronted here uh, in the beginning of, uh, of the year is indeed uh, the COVID-19. COVID-19 can be uh, defined in a way also as a cybersecurity uh, threat from, from the point of view that it accelerated uh, digitization, uh, leading to uh, an increasing attack surface uh, uh, that uh, uh, involves uh, now, uh, a much higher uh, number of employees of companies, but uh, even students, for example. Um, and at the same time, uh, it has made uh, people more uh, uh, vulnerable, if you want, to all, all sorts of threats, including cybersecurity uh, threats. The result of this, um, it has been a, an increase of, uh, of an attacks. We've seen a spike, uh, especially the, uh, when lockdowns were in place, uh, meaning in uh, uh, March and, and in April. And we've also seen, uh, um, you know, very concerning episodes, uh, especially against uh, uh, hospitals uh, with targeted attacks uh, that took place, for example, in, uh, in Czech Republic, disrupting, of course, the activity uh, of hospitals. So uh, what was the, the response that we put in place from a policy point of view to, to COVID? Uh, let's say that we mostly focused on uh, information sharing uh, between uh, EU, EU actors uh, as well. And I mean, including, of course, uh, all information that, that we had for, from member states. Member states uh, were under uh, a higher level, uh, let's say, of uh, uh, awareness and alert. And this resulted into uh, aggregated uh, situational reports uh, to which the various uh, uh, communities of cybersecurity, so including the diplomatic community uh, as well as the law enforcement community, uh, represented, for example, by, by Europol, uh, contributed. So we increased the information sharing. Uh, and at the same time, we also uh, provided support to uh, some of the mitigation tools that member states have put in place, uh, such as the contract tracing apps, uh, the commission issued a recommendation in April this year, uh, making sure that uh, uh, the apps uh, would um, fulfill some essential requirements so that they would be effective. Uh, uh, at the same time, they need to be uh, privacy uh, preserving, interoperable, and uh, voluntary. From a cybersecurity point of view, uh, let's say that we put around our, uh, our radar uh, with particular attention the fact that uh, uh, cybersecurity will be taken into account throughout the whole life cycle uh, using. 
uh, encryption as well as uh, um, communication security uh, techniques uh, as well as uh, secure uh, development practices. So this is what we've done uh, with COVID, uh, but now it's, it's time, hopefully, uh, for, for recovering, of course, uh, um, you know, um, or hoping that second waves uh, uh, don't strike, um, let's say, or don't make too much damage uh, to our economy. So why is this important for uh, for cybersecurity? Uh, so next generation EU uh, is the um, is the framework that has been put in place by the Commission uh, with uh, financing from uh, EU level uh, and several instruments. Uh, you would see here one of them is the Recovery and Resilience Facility. Uh, so this is important because uh, it will help the economies not only to respond to the uh, economic impact of uh, of COVID uh, but also to uh, transform themselves uh, according to uh, different priorities uh, uh, and uh, one of the key priorities as uh, I'm sure you're uh, you're aware about is uh, uh, digital um, so this is an extract from uh, uh, last month uh, State of the Union speech by President von der Leyen when, when she highlighted that basically uh, this must be Europe's digital decade it means that we need to have clear uh, goals in terms of uh, um, capabilities that we want to have in place between here and 2030 uh, and uh, one of the priorities under digital uh, is definitely for us cyber security um, so this concretely translates into a 20 percent of the next generation eu investment uh, that will be dedicated to to digital and then some of those funds will also go to the development of cyber security capabilities um, so the the 20 percent of uh, what uh, of the uh, resilience and recovery facility uh, which accounts for a total of uh, uh, 670 trillion uh, of which we have uh, 360 billion in loans and the rest in uh, in grants so this is what uh, let's say uh, the future holds uh, but um, at the same time let me be more specific about the research and industrial capabilities that we would like uh, to develop uh, we have already uh, ongoing some uh, uh, research activities uh, and uh, Horizon 2020 call, uh, so the last Horizon 2020 uh, uh, call, because the, the program is going to end at the end of, uh, of this year, uh, which is focusing on uh, um, a different range of, uh, of topics, uh, uh, starting, of course, with the um, intelligent security and privacy management, uh, um, SMEs capabilities, uh, the intersection uh, between uh, uh, cybersecurity and uh, sectoral, uh, let's say, uh, overall cybersecurity and uh, sectoral aspects, uh, especially in the field of energy. Uh, then we have the development of uh, uh, increased, uh, uh, increasingly developed uh, prevention and detection capabilities. Uh, and finally, uh, we have uh, intelligence and security. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, trying to strike the balance uh, between uh, uh, opportunities and challenges for for law enforcement. So this is what we have in place so far uh, and the funding that we have here you've seen that the funding accounts for for millions uh, but actually we expect this to to grow uh, much more um, in the next seven years so between 21 and 27 um, we will have uh, 6.7 billions uh, allocated to uh, digital europe uh, which is the next uh, uh, let's say uh, big program spending program that the commission has in place and uh, uh, cybersecurity will be one of the three priorities under Digital Europe for a total of 1.8 billion uh, of investment, which are expected hopefully to, to be matched by uh, also member state investment. So what, what, what uh, Digital Europe will do in the future? Um, we, we, um, we identified some initial uh, um, priorities that Digital Europe could tackle. Uh, definitely, uh, there is the support to national coordination centers. I, I will explain uh, now what this means. At the same time, we have the um, capacity building in terms of, especially of uh, quantum secure public communication infrastructure, the support to certification, the development of uh, um, uh, cybersecurity tools, especially uh, when it comes to uh, detection, and uh, uh, finally, the support to the implementation of, of regulation, especially the NIS directive, which concerns um, the critical infrastructures. So, um, there will be also uh, not only uh, Digital Europe um, priorities, but also uh, Horizon Europe uh, priorities. So, these are funds uh, that will be related not, not only to capabilities, but also to, to research development. And uh, these are uh, the topics uh, that uh, will probably be uh, supported by Horizon. You see here uh, the development of AI, 
uh, for cybersecurity, uh, advanced cryptography, uh, security uh, certification again, and then hardware, software, and supply chain. So how we're going to uh, coordinate this uh, um, this funding effort? Uh, let's see how we're going to make sure the resources are uh, streamlined and uh, uh, spent in a coherent way between member states. So our proposal uh, since back 2018 is to establish a cybersecurity competence center and network. Uh, this, is, uh, this will be a physical center located, uh, uh, we still don't know when, uh, where, because uh, discussions are taking place in council, but uh, we hope that uh, they are going to be finalized before the end of the year. Um, so once in place, the fund will uh, manage, uh, the center will manage the fund uh, the, that, I, that I mentioned before, uh, and it will facilitate coordination indeed between national centers. So each member state will have in place at least a national coordination center. Uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, will uh, support not only the development of capabilities, but also the deployment of uh, um, industrial solutions. Uh, when it comes to the national centers, uh, uh, here in this case, of course, they should be uh, the focus of uh, um, research coordination uh, and uh, um, funding coordination uh, in each member state. Uh, but at the same time, the, the center as well as the networks, uh, uh, as well as the network, should be open as much as possible also to uh, a much wider group of stakeholders uh, uh, through um, the so-called competence community. Uh, allowing, of course, the private sector to and the academia to uh, build into this process and to uh, provide their, their point of view uh, into uh, the coordination needs. So, uh, not only we uh, we issued the proposal uh, for, for the competence center, but we also uh, have uh, four pilot projects that identified how to uh, better prepare uh, cooperation uh, between the national uh, centers and so. Uh, within the Cybersecurity Competence Network. Uh, so these four projects were launched back in 2018 and uh, account for 63.5 uh, million uh, euros. Okay, so, so uh, going then to the second leg, let's say, uh, of our policy initiatives. Uh, uh, of course, research is, is very much important and of course having a, a strong uh, EU, um, uh, EU players uh, in all the different fields, including in cybersecurity, is key for us. Uh, but the, there is so much that it, can, that it can do. I mean, it's also important to have uh, uh, regulation and resilient practices in place. When it comes to regulation, our cornerstone is the uh, NIS directive. Basically, the directive says that uh, those operators, uh, organizations that, that are under critical sectors, uh, um, there are several critical sectors going from health to transport, uh, energy, financial markets, uh, banking, uh, uh, drinking water management. Um, uh, basically, uh, those operators, uh, they have to um, have put in place security measures, uh, of course, according to risk-based approach and uh, uh, they have to notify relevant incidents to uh, national authorities and national seizures. Uh, it's also very important for us the fact that uh, the NIS directive uh, triggered uh, for the first time cooperation, structured cooperation on cybersecurity at EU level uh, through the NIS Cooperation Group, uh, which is a strategic, strategic forum uh, gathering um, cybersecurity authorities, uh, as well as technical level uh, between national seizures uh, gathered into the uh, NIS, into the CSER network. So the directive uh, has been in place since 2016. Uh, we can say that uh, it has significantly strengthened uh, capabilities at EU level, um, but it's now time for review. Um, so the directive will be reviewed uh, by the end of the year, the end of 2019. Uh, we, are, we had already a snapshot of uh, how the directive is working in terms of uh, uh, identifying operators, uh, um, uh, so entities that have to be subject to cybersecurity requirements uh, within the EU. Uh, you can see here uh, one of the main outcomes of a report that was issued in November last year, which highlighted that there are uh, significant differences in the identification of these operators, and this may cause uh, imbalances when it comes to regulatory costs over um, operators uh, that are competitors over the same markets. Uh, this also coming from the point of view that the NIS is uh, uh, an internal market uh, uh, instrument that, that uh, aims mostly uh, at ensuring the correct functioning of the internal market. Other challenges, or I mean like uh, things that we're looking at very carefully now in the review of the directive uh, are, um, are, let's say, 
uh, the security requirements uh, and uh, how they've been identified by member states, uh, uh, the identification processes in place and uh, how cumbersome is for operators to notify, uh, the uh, role of digital services providers. So digital services providers are cloud computing uh, um, uh, companies uh, for search engines and online marketplaces, which, which are subject to, um, let's say, lighter um, regulatory regime uh, and looking now at how this is working compared to essential operators. Uh, we're looking at the scope. So th th there are a, a lot of different um, aspects uh, that the directive uh, um, will um, evaluation will look at, and you will see the result of this evaluation uh, uh, in December um, in December uh, 2020. Now, uh, when there, there will probably be a new proposal. Um, at the same time, this, this uh, aim to be. Uh, an open uh, process. Uh, this is why uh, we had open until uh, I think the 2nd of October an open public consultation where stakeholders could indeed provide their feedback on uh, on these uh, subjects and many other aspects of the directive. So uh, another critical aspect of uh, um, of the resilience building for us is certification uh, through the Cybersecurity Act 2019. There is now in place a voluntary framework for certification. Uh, which allows to have uh, to certify basically products, services, and solutions in one uh, member state in the EU, and make sure that the certificate that you obtain is valid uh, across the EU. So this is the life cycle uh, of uh, how um, uh, a certification scheme is uh, uh, is issued. So basically, uh, what the Cyber Act does, uh, it, it creates a framework uh, allowing for different products and services. Uh, to be certified uh, uh, following the creation of a scheme. Um, so this is the process. Uh, so the process is a multi-stakeholder process. Uh, um, it involves, of course, input from member states, which is channeled through ENISA, the EU Cybersecurity Agency. Uh, and uh, stakeholders also have a say into the European Cybersecurity Group. Um, and then uh, ENISA prepares schemes, which are then adopted by the Commission uh, through secondary legislation. Uh, this means through um, of course, agreement with, with member states. Um, so far, we don't have schemes uh, in place uh, for, uh, for certification at EU level. Uh, nevertheless, we, we are developing uh, two schemes. So the first one will be to uh, reflect the SOGIS MRA uh, mutual recognition agreement, which was in a sense the predecessor of uh, the, um, the cybersecurity framework for certification. Um, this was uh, an agreement with the member states of mutual recognition for certificates uh, that are valid, for example, for um, ID card. And uh, uh, the second then scheme that is a candidate scheme is uh, a new scheme for certifying cloud. Um, further to that, uh, so these are uh, two schemes that are currently under development and we hope to finalize them soon. So that indeed, um, uh, stakeholders across the EU can start certifying their products and solutions. But further to that, we will have, uh, by the end of the year, a union rolling work program. Basically, uh, this document will identify what are the strategic priorities in terms of uh, um, upcoming schemes, so next things that uh, will be able to be certified at EU level. The strategic priorities here, you can see a snapshot of uh, what probably they're going to be. Uh, they're going to involve, of course, uh, standardization, security by design, risk-based assurance, and, uh, uh, of course, international cooperation. Uh, so trying to make sure that uh, EU certificates are in line uh, with international standards and practices. Finally, when it comes to, um, when it comes to resilience, resilience also uh, has a very, let's say, sectorial or technology-specific dimension. So this is what we uh, saw with the security, cybersecurity of 5G networks. And uh, you may be aware of the fact that uh, EU issued a recommendation last year, um, uh, I mean, arguing for uh, the need to have an uh, EU approach to um, a coordinated approach to the cybersecurity of 5G networks, taking into account, of course, EU needs and uh, uh, member state needs. So the approach, uh, the, this recommendation led, led to the adoption of uh, a coordinated uh, risk assessment last year. Uh, and adoption then of a toolbox of measures uh, uh, that have been identified by member states and by the union has, uh, you know, the most appropriate measures to uh, mitigate the cybersecurity risk to the uh, really uh, link to the deployment of 5G networks. Uh, the recommendation is now, uh, the toolbox is now being uh, implemented and uh, 
uh, we will have uh, a first idea of um, uh, how the EU could possibly review the recommendation also by the end of this year. So, um, what this means in terms of uh, uh, measures, uh, um, as you can see, um, 5G is, is a very complex issue, and uh, uh, in order to mitigate risks, uh, there needs to be uh, action uh, both at standardization and certification level, uh, there needs to be cooperation with um, uh, MNOs and with uh, uh, national uh, uh, telecom companies and uh, national telecom supervisors, which are gathered in BEREC at EU level. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's not only about security measures, but uh, possibly also about uh, other areas uh, involving, for example, foreign direct investments, as well as uh, competition rules. Uh, so this, this all plays a role into making sure that the cybersecurity of, of 5G supply chain is, uh, is, uh, is guaranteed. Uh, and of course, in all of these, uh, it's important to monitor. Finally, what is the third leg of EU policy making? Uh, basically, it's cooperation. So uh, we can fund, of course, the development of uh, increased uh, technologies from a cybersecurity point of view. Uh, we can regulate, uh, uh, but uh, as the previous speaker was saying, uh, without sharing information, uh, um, we, we cannot really achieve our goals. Uh, how to do that? Um, not only through the previous structures that, that I mentioned to you, so um, the CSER network and, and the cooperation group, so structures gathering national CSERs and national competent authorities, but also by having basically a plan uh, in case uh, a cybersecurity crisis or large-scale incident strikes. So this plan is represented by the blueprint, uh, a recommendation issued in 2017 by the Commission, uh, which basically says, I mean, um, recommends member states to uh, have in place uh, um, contact points and start under operating procedures uh, at technical, uh, meaning CSER level, operational and political level, with a view to facilitating uh, um, a coherent uh, and as fast as possible response uh, to uh, cybersecurity crisis and, and incidents. So this is not only then uh, um, affecting the member state level, but also the uh, EU level. Uh, as you see here, uh, there is the need also to uh, coordinate uh, between different uh, um, EU communities. So not only the civilian one, but also the defence, the law enforcement one, through uh, standard operating procedures. So what is the progress uh, that we've been doing? Uh, actually, there is a lot of work that is now going into uh, this uh, strand of action. Uh, we recently had uh, the second uh, Blue Alex exercise, as we call it. Uh, this is an exercise between the national cybersecurity authorities uh, that basically um, uh, test and uh, continue to develop standard operating procedures for uh, cooperation in case of crisis among them. The Blue Alex exercise that took place last week, uh, unfortunately uh, virtually, even if it was organized very efficiently by uh, our Dutch colleagues, so the participation of uh, um, a lot of uh, executives from national um, cybersecurity authorities and so also very importantly the, la the launch of a new cooperation cyclone uh, cooperation sorry <laughs> network this is called cyclone cyber crisis liaison organization network quite complex but basically the um, this, the, the objective of this network is to uh, put uh, in contact uh, uh, national uh, crisis cooperation uh, national um, uh, crisis uh, managers, so those that are responsible for managing crisis at national level, uh, in a way that they can regularly exchange information uh, and also uh, put in place uh, preparedness actions, such as uh, uh, ex regular exercises, and in case also a crisis strikes, uh, they can facilitate uh, the decision making at political level. So this is what we have in place for coordination. Um, I, I think that, that I provided you, uh, let's say, with a quite broad overview of our key actions. Um, and I also told you that uh, th there are going to be a number of uh, initiatives uh, that we'll see further developments uh, before the end of the year. So what are the next steps? Uh, in December 2020, uh, we will see, um, indeed, uh, a number of, of actions uh, taking the next step, uh, like the review of the NIS directive, I mentioned the Union Rolling Work Program uh, and uh, the review of the 5G uh, recommendation. Uh, furthermore, um, we will have uh, a new cybersecurity strategy that will accompany uh, all of this. So this was announced also in the context of uh, uh, Next Generation EU. Uh, the strategy will revise uh, um, the, the latest strategic orientation that we issued uh, in uh, 2017. 
And uh, we will have also uh, a new building block, uh, the uh, Joint Cyber Unit. Uh, so the Joint Cyber Unit was uh, announced uh, uh, here. You, you have some text from the um, uh, President von der Leyen the political guidelines and uh, will basically allow us to make a next step in terms of uh, uh, cooperation, what I mentioned so far. So information sharing uh, between member states. Uh, in a way, as, as uh, President von der Leyen put it, uh, moving from a need to know to a need to share. So this is very much it. Uh, uh, before concluding, uh, I would like indeed to recall the fact that uh, uh, the uh, European Cybersecurity Month um, awareness raising campaign is ongoing. So I definitely invite you to uh, visit the Cybersecurity Month website and as well as to uh, participate to the social media challenge. Um, basically, you can upload a video, short video, explaining uh, um, uh, your story uh, about uh, falling victim to a scam, and uh, also uh, and also um, sharing uh, uh, possibly your tips on uh, how to avoid that. You, you, so th that's pretty much it. I also encourage you to um, probably visit our website and our social media, but also to subscribe to our newsletter, Cybersecurity and Digital Privacy Newsletter, uh, as well as, of course, if you want to uh, get in touch with me personally, uh, here my my email address and uh, uh, social media um, details. Thank you. Thank you. So, are there any questions in the room? No, that is it. Are there any questions online? Okay, there are some questions online. Uh, maybe Christian, you can take over with questions. Okay, so we have a couple of questions. And um, the first one is that uh, you said that you want to uptake of cybersecurity certification. Is there any evidence that certification reduced or mitigated attacks in the past? Okay, um, I don't know, perhaps I, um, I take more questions uh, and then I respond uh, to, I don't know if there, there are more. Yes, there are more questions. Okay. So the next one is, as it is well known that hospitals suffer regularly from cyber attacks and based on the first case of a patient who died during a cyber attack on a German hospital, do you know if the EU Commission is going to take any actions regarding cybersecurity towards our medical care, for example, by introducing mandatory training for staff members, more strict regulations regarding cyber attacks, etc.? And then, yeah. yeah, you want to answer? Or? Uh, I don't know. Perhaps I can t I can take another one and then answer to, to these first three. Yes. Um, please, could you give more detail of how cloud candidate scheme will be beyond the ISO IEC 27018 standard? Will it cover cloud providers who are controllers rather than just processors? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Thanks a lot indeed for, for the very interesting questions. So um, with regard to, I will start perhaps indeed with, uh, with, with, with health. Uh, so indeed, it's, uh, it's very worrying what we've seen, not, uh, not only during COVID, but most recently uh, with uh, the first possible attack. Uh, uh, so the first attack possibly leading to um, the loss of life, uh, which happened recently in Germany, uh, in Dusseldorf. Uh, let's say that indeed, uh, uh, after COVID, uh, um, health is definitely looked at as uh, one of the priorities in terms of sectors for us, uh, because I mean, like um, also when it comes into the review of, of the uh, NIS directive implementation, uh, we also carried out national visits, um, so meeting with the national authorities as well as operators, and uh, we realized that health is one of the uh, least developed sectors uh, for uh, for obvious reasons because of course cybersecurity is not uh, their um, core business and uh, uh, they have scarce resources uh, uh, and in lot of, and of course uh, these resources are spent uh, most of times uh, um, into the um, care of patients uh, and and also there is a strong involvement uh, from the public sector which sometimes uh, leads indeed to the scarcity of resources 
So because all of this, we, we see definitely health as, as a priority. So it is already covered under the uh, NIS directive, uh, uh, and in particular hospitals, as uh, one of the um, essential sectors. Uh, at, the, at the same time, uh, there is um, a work stream of uh, the cooperation group that I mentioned uh, beforehand, meaning that uh, member state authorities, they meet regularly to uh, exchange information about health, uh, about the health sector, the implementation of the directive, and uh, and best practices. Uh, this may mean, of course, that uh, uh, the cooperation group may identify some uh, further, um, let's say, sector-specific requirements for um, operators that member states may put in place, um, especially when it comes to hospitals. I heard training, uh, this may be uh, one of them. For the future, uh, definitely uh, we also see the need to, to provide further funding uh, for uh, operators uh, um, of essential service, but not only, I mean, like for, for health operators. So this would be um, one, of, one of the follow-up actions. Uh, and uh, it is also, I guess, important the fact that we recently launched this summer uh, the first, uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, European Health Isaac. Uh, then, when it comes to uh, certification, uh, um, I mean, uh, we know that certification is not a silver bullet in the sense that uh, uh, it, it does not solve all the problems. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the rationale behind the, the Cyber Act, so uh, the adoption of this regulation, uh, is that uh, uh, it, it can uh, contribute to creating a, a culture of uh, um, uh, compliance and a culture of, uh, um, let's say, risk-based uh, risk measures. Uh, and uh, um, of course, that, this is why we think that certification needs to go uh, hand in hand uh, also with, um, with other sort of, um, of compliance. For example, uh, for those authorities that are subject to, uh, for those operators that are subject to uh, the NAS directive. Uh, and then uh, when it comes to, to the cloud schemes, uh, um, so let's say the principle is of course to adhere as much as possible to international standards. So I think uh, that also ISO standards will be, uh, are part of the reflection. Uh, and I think that also more information is, uh, is available uh, online with the first candidate uh, scheme no, actually, this is the second kind of the scheme, but uh, uh, with the um, proposed structure of the scheme uh, that is uh, that has been shared by NISA. Okay, thank you. We have one more question, and it says uh, some of the costiest attacks were carried out using zero days held back by security agencies. So, for example, NSA with WannaCry. Um, you did not mention any strategies that encourage EU member states to disclose their known vulnerabilities. Do you think this is a valid strategy or should states be able to keep known vulnerabilities secret for offensive reasons? Okay. Um, okay. Is, is there uh, any other one or? No, that's the. Okay. Indeed. Um, thanks also for this question. I think that uh, um, vulnerability sharing, it's, uh, I mean, like, n n not only from a, a member state point of view, but also from, a, let's say, um, an industry point of view, it's uh, it's very much important. And I think it it, it links into, uh, I mean, links to the uh, culture of uh, sharing and cooperation that I mentioned uh, uh, at the end of my presentation. Um, so, uh, we definitely see the need to have uh, a more structured approach um, towards uh, vulnerability sharing um, and uh, um, at the same time to create an information sharing uh, ecosystem, um, possibly within um, the context of the NIS review as well as uh, with the, in the context of the joint cyber unit that I just mentioned, that brings together, of course, not only uh, public but also private. Uh, um, providing the right incentives, uh, let's say, for um, private uh, uh, operators uh, as well as to public operators to, to share more. Um, so we, we believe that these incentives uh, are not only related to obligations. Uh, so, for example, we already have in place obligations to share incidents, but we think that uh, uh, we should create more also voluntary incentives, uh, uh, not only us, but also member states. Uh, to make sure that incidents as well as vulnerability are shared in a coherent way and that, uh, of course, everybody benefits from the uh, increased knowledge uh, that comes out of this. So um, I think that the point is, is taken and uh, that you will probably see a more uh, from our side uh, when it comes to vulnerability uh, sharing in, in the coming months. I, at the same time, I also want to say that already the Cyber Act uh, touches upon that and um, incentivizes the, the sharing of vulnerabilities through uh, ENISA. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have no more questions. So yeah, thank you very much for joining us today.
giving this interesting talk and I hand over to Cynthia for the rest. Thank you very much. So thanks a lot. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, well, so that's already the end of this conference. So I would like to thank you, the audience that was here today, our speakers that were volunteering for doing a talk here, and uh, also uh, the audience online. Thank you very much for your patience due to our small technical problems and your patience for waiting sometimes for this live getting up and so. So for next year, I would like to say, uh, I hope to meet you again physically here in the room, not only via online conference. Online conference had the advantage that we also had partners joining from outside of Luxembourg. So thank you very much for joining us today. And I would love to invite you to our next event that will take place on January 28, 2021, uh, which is a data privacy day that will take place here uh, at the Maison du Savoir as well. But if we will meet online or come here to site, will be decided in future. So we keep you updated. And I hope to see you back next year, so many of you, and for this, I will not stand in between you and lunch. So have a nice day and hope to see you next year again. Thank you and bye bye. <laughs>